Exchange? Well, NordVPN can dock to any surface to a new location so that your IP address is set for you to win. Want to watch a game on a free stream in another hemisphere? Give NordVPN the ball. Or if you just want to watch a clip on social media that a cricket board won't allow, promote NordVPN to pinch hit. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba to get a two-year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a bowler protects the boundaries in the death overs with nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba today. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 7 of the Overthrows podcast. I'm Behram Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. We've got Parv and Karan Nagpal in the comments. So hello to you guys as well. And we've got a lot to talk about today. So let's start with India versus England. So India did win the final test match in Dharamshala uh, quite comprehensively by an innings and 64 runs. So absolutely hammered England. And ended up winning the series with a margin of four games to one. So, basketball has been defeated, Jared. And even though when the series started, England won a test and we got all excited. And then they had a couple of chances to maybe win mm. another. But then it's ended pretty much how we expected it to end, hasn't it? Yeah, it was interesting that um, Brendan McCullum kind of... It was his first sort of cold cup of coffee, right? And he kind of mm. talked about how it had happened because... You know, I've kind of hinted at this before, but there were certainly people within the English setup who thought it was laughable that they were going to go to India and win. And when they won that first test, I think, and and, and to be fair, Stokes and McCullum did believe. Hmm. And when they won that first test, I do think there was an element of everyone jumping on board and being like, yeah, this must work. And and by the end, McCullum is the one going, yeah, maybe we weren't smart enough here and, and, hmm. and everything else. And it's the sort of stuff all of us have been talking about. It's yeah. like th there are definitely people who just want to say that basketball never works, right? Which is just, I don't know. I Good luck to all of them. And there's very smart people saying it. The numbers don't make any sense to me when you look at it. It has worked. They were a terrible team. They became a fairly decent team, but it was always going to be inconsistent because of how many risks they would take. I think that's all fair. But the other side of it is that we keep saying, what, the, during the Ashes and the New Zealand series and, and now through this series of, why get yourself into a good position and then just like stuff it up for the sake of the narrative, right? We we are entertainers. Well, you know, at a certain point, you also have to win. And I'm not saying you can't be both, but I don't think you have to sacrifice um, winning in order to entertain. I, I mean, say what you want about England. They are the most entertaining cricket team mm. uh, in, in test cricket at the moment by a long distance. If they were 20% less entertaining and they won, you know, 18% more, They'd be a really, really cool team, right? Like no, no one would be like, oh, they're not in it. They're really boring now. They're still pretty out there. So it's interesting that 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 side of it. And if you go through all my stuff in the ashes, it's what I just kept talking about again and again of like, stop, stop believing the hype and start working out what bit works for you and what bit doesn't work for you. And it feels like yeah. now they're closer to that than ever before. But but I also get the other side. I get that whole idea of you know the the cigar mantras and all that sort of stuff because you're trying to make flawed cricketers go up against the best players in the world. And, you know, when you're playing India or in Australia, you kind of have to pump them up, right? Like I get that, but why don't we pump them up and be smart at the same time? That McCullum's not a dumb, was not a dumb cricketer, right? He was a really, really smart cricketer. And I think if they'd focus more on the things that made sense, um, rather than uh, uh, we're the reason that Jaiswell has made runs. And um, and we, you know, morally, I think you could say we're ahead. No, shut the fuck up. Just <laughs> like, just be honest and go, we lost that test in Edgebaston. We should have won it. We lost that test in New Zealand. We should have won it, right? And Jaiswell is fantastic. And we have to work out how to get the fucker out, not talk about how we've inspired him. Yeah, I mean, I think... The first time or for the first time ever, I've heard those sort of statements now after losing 4-1 mm. that Ben Stokes has said that, okay, you know what, after five test matches, I can we can we're man enough to say that the better team won. I haven't heard that from the Baz ballers yet. So I do believe to your point that you know we've gone through one entire cycle of baseball. They've gone with the whole dogmatic sort of mm. mindset that we are the be all and end all and entertainment over results and all of that stuff. But after that one entire cycle, they've realized that, okay, we 
drew a series at home versus Australia and couldn't retain the Ashes. And we got, you know, pounded in India. So now, and, and, and drew, drew the series in New Zealand, they should have won. And, and drew the series in New Zealand, they should have won. Exactly. So now in that next cycle of basketball that we'll definitely get, because they've done enough not to lose their jobs over here. And I mm. do still think, uh, like you, that there are elements of basketball that really do work. And it's good for them. And they've won more than they've won before, right? It was really funny to me that by the fourth test, the Indian fans were like completely shitting on basketball. And I was like, without, without portraying confidences, people inside the Indian camp in their first two tests were shook, hmm. right? Raul Dravid was like going around to his batters going, we've got to sweep more. No, you don't. Just play the way you play. You don't have to sweep more, right? Um, you know, there were all these little things happening that they were upset about. And look at, look at Ashwin when he had that press conference. He was like, I think this game is equal, even. No, it's not. You're two, over 200 runs in front. Like, it's not equal. It, it will take them a really good batting to get to your score, let alone in front of your score, which is what they need to do in this kind of test. So it did shake them a little bit. I think it's easier. <laughs> I think it's a little bit easier to get to a point where um, when you've lost, you can be a bit more honest. And So, so for me as an analyst, uh, my, the worst situations for me was when our team won, right? Uh, and I knew we'd not done particularly well. Right. So I, I think the one that I remember is my last year, uh, my, sorry, my only year at um, Melbourne Stars when we, we shouldn't have made the finals, but there was a game that we, that where two teams had shared the points because the lights had gone out. So we sneaked our way into fourth, right? We then had a really good strategy against Hobart. And we beat Hobart. We got to the final. We probably should have won the final, right? And I wrote this big report going, yeah, but we are also, like we, we, everyone's going to say we should have won the final. They're forgetting that for us this season, we were pretty inconsistent and we just scraped our way in anyway. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed here. That's not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear what are the slight tweaks we need to make? Whereas I was like, I still think there's some fundamental things that we need to get back and start. And I think the draws or drawn series, especially the, you know, if you think about those two drawn series we just mentioned, New Zealand and Australia, they should have won both of those, probably. I, I would argue, having covered both of those series, they were probably, pound for pound, all the way through the series, the better team, mm. right? Now, that doesn't mean that Australia doesn't didn't deserve to be in the position they were in because they stole the moments from England when it mattered. And New Zealand, incredible comeback from New Zealand to win that other test match. But England were probably the better team. So maybe at that stage, it's hard for them to go, how do we distill this a little bit? But the other side is that it's funny now that... <laughs> All I get is comments about the um, from from uh, especially Indian fans at the moment, but yeah, but also you know Pakistani and Australian um, fans and South African fans go. Oh, the English media is just hyping up the team. The English media is absolutely famous for slandering their team. Yeah. Okay? Throughout the history of cricket, right? They are more. They put the foot in. They're so much more independent than I mean. I grew up in Australia. Australian media. I've never seen this particularly independent. I'd say it's almost a wing of the cricket team at certain times, right? And the England team can, the England media can be that. They can also be the complete opposite and they can do that for years or decades if they have to, mm. right? I think a lot of the McCullumness of it and, and the Stokes, that, that sort of confidence and everything else came from, we have to kind of just, it, this may not work. They knew it wouldn't work consistently. They were, if we're being honest, I think, I think if you listen to some of the things that McCullum, I think, specifically said, he was like, even he was surprised they were winning as much as they were when they first started this, right? But it, they, had to, they had to portray that confidence a little bit because they were trying to pump up what is a flawed bunch of players. If it wasn't a flawed bunch of players, they wouldn't have had to bowl Joe Root to death, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> If it wasn't a flawed bunch of players, they would have picked two kids who almost never bowled in first class cricket before and said, good luck, right? Like and another guy who played one test, he's not even sure if he's a batter or a bowler, was like one of their frontline spinners at one stage. But Ollie Robertson of like, do we even play Ollie Robertson? Yeah. Is this like, you know, where are we with this? Um, we'll we'll so, keep him around to write stuff about us. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe he's our PR agent or our anti-PR agent. I'm not sure. So... <laughs> The, the point being is that I do think there was a lot of nonsense. And I said this before when people were like, I can't believe England have said this at this press conference. They weren't, they weren't really saying it for the press because they knew that a lot of it would be, that's what the England press do. There's what, nine different newspapers in England. They all get the same quotes and they all go, you know, they all go in different directions with the exact same quotes. When the England team was talking, they were talking for the change room. And that is a very different thing that we don't see a lot of in cricket. And I thought that was a really, really interesting way of doing it. But 
there was also, as you and I know, complete and utter batshit things that were said, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, and if they've got past that, that's a positive. I mean, when I look at baseball iteration one, which has just completed, it started off with, you know, 11 victories out of 12. That was mm -hmm. what the number looked like once upon a time, I remember. And from a scale of like conventional to batshit crazy left field, they were on this side of the spectrum, batshit crazy left field. I feel in iteration two, if they can land somewhere 75% towards yep. batshit type, you know, crazy left field, I think that's where maybe the magic will be at. But we'll, of course, know with time how that, uh, you know, uh, comes about and, and whether or not baseball survives and what it evolves into. Anyway, let's come to uh, India. And mm. uh, 16 of the 20 English wickets that fell in Dharamshala, which is generally, you know, thought of as a place where pace bowlers do well, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, those wickets fell to Ashwin and Kuldeep. And, uh, you know, let's talk about Kuldeep first because England's first innings collapsed. They were going quite well. They were, what, 100 for two. And Kuldeep kind of removed uh, five of their top six batters yeah. and ended up with five for 72. And I think after this test match and after the series, for me at least, Kuldeep Yadav has established himself as a test match regular in, in their home tests, at least, India's. Yeah, it's, he's, I mean, I, I thought by the end of the series, he was bowling even better than he was at the start. I thought he, you know, he moved forward. Uh, he was more in control of the way he bowled. He was more confident. Uh, you know, early on, England tried to knock him out uh, of, of the attack. By the end, they didn't even look like that was an option for them, right? That, that's how much he developed confidence and, you know, his ability to land the ball where he wanted and everything else. It's a complicating, uh, he's, well, in India, it's perfect, right? You just play Ashwin, Jadeja, and Cool Deep, uh, Boomer, and whichever other person wants to bowl six overs of seam for you, right? <laughs> Absolutely fine. It does get more complicated when they travel overseas and they want to play a five uh, person attack. And, uh, you know, and, and once they get into that five person attack, like if you don't pick Ashwin, you're then got a very, very skinny number eight. And I know a lot of people are very excited about how Cool Deep's batted at times in this series that's going to be tested in, you know, playing in Australia, right? Like he got bounced out by Jimmy Anderson. Yeah. Like I'm just saying Australian pitches are a little bit faster than, than up north in India. Um, and the Australian bowls are a little bit faster than Jimmy Anderson. That's and going to... Know, and you'll know that Ashwin is someone who will just wear it on his body. Yeah. yeah and it's not... It's a fair point as well. You, we, it's not that we think Ashwin's not going to get bounced out or not going to get hit or anything. But the point being that Kuldi has to go through all that sort of stuff. He has to learn it. And he has, you know... Mm. And, and, and everything else. Also, I think he's a very, I see him as a really, really good number nine, like a, like a Jason Gillespie, Matthew Hoggard with slightly more shots than those two, but that kind of number nine where he can kind of stick in um, at number eight, he's a little bit more exposed in, in that situation. Does that mean that, you know, Lord Takur comes back in or, or you know, what, whatever that variation is, we have to, we have to work out, but it does complicate things a little bit more on the road, but in India, this is absolutely perfect. Right, I you've mean, got Jadeja, Ashwin, and Cool Deep. It's per it could not work any more perfectly for them at home. And they had Akshar before, and he was pretty good. Yeah, I would just be tempted to play Cool Deep in Sydney. Otherwise, I think he doesn't warrant a spot overseas or in Sena Nations just yet. But in Sydney, I, I might be tempted. Oh, I don't know. I just think in Australia, if you can't pick his wrong in, um, it, I think he's all. It, it, we saw we just saw England players all the way through the series, and you're talking about Ben Stokes and Bearstow, right? So you're talking about guys who played a lot of international cricket, not picky's wrong in the fifth test. Yeah. And wrist spinners in Australia are usually more of a threat than finger spinners. So I know what you're saying. I, I get the overall point of what you're saying, but I, I, I the way he's bowling at the moment, and I've seen him bowl against Australia on a week um, up north as well. Um in, in Durham Mashallah back back whenever it was, when it, when he wasn't anywhere near this bowler. I think he's still got a real place in Australia, but I think you're you're also right. I'm not sure they can play him in every test, and I do think yeah. that is part of the issue going forward uh, and with, uh, and how it works for them. Absolutely, and of course, time will unfold how India's eleven kind of uh, you know shapes up across different conditions. But in home tests, I think both of us are in agreement that Kuldeep definitely plays. Now we've got some more people who've joined us in the comments. We had Pav and Karan Nagpal earlier. We've got Akira, Asian Frat Boy One. Muki Shivam Chaudhary, who has caught the live show for the first time. So, welcome. And, uh, yeah, let's talk about Ravi Ashwin now. Of course, he took nine wickets in this game. Four in the first innings and five in the second. And, uh, you know, Ashwin, 
wasn't performing at peak levels in this series, had a bit of a family emergency as well, mm. came back, you know, struck gold. And in this test match, we finally saw that Ashwin of old because he was just unstoppable. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think someone else might have put this on Twitter and me and Cheyenne are talking about it quite a bit as well, that once he started bowling with the new ball again, he looked a lot more dynamic. That That's great, but it's also a bit of a concern because... Does that mean he doesn't quite have the snap anymore with the, with the older softer ball to be a constant threat that he used to be? I, I don't know. Um, but the way he, once he got that new ball in his hand um, and started bowling with it regularly, England just didn't have any answers, right? Like the, the Ben Duckett's shot, I'll probably do a big video on this because I think it's really interesting looking at Ben Duckett's shot and the two Joe Root shots in this series of understanding why batters make such bad decisions. And, you know, baseball sort of fries your brain a little bit as well. Like if you're a batter of like, oh, I can't let him get on top of me. But he had just completely worked Ben Duckett over to a point where Ben Duckett didn't think there was another option other than just running down the wicket and hoping for the best. And that's peak Ashwin, right? When, you know, you're a left-hander and you just think there's no point me standing here uh, because I'm just taking up space and, and might as well get a right-hander in and maybe they'll be able to survive an extra 20 balls. Um, and I, look, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. You know, there were people talking about whether he was past it. I, I still think there are signs that maybe he wasn't as sharp as he has been in previous series. And I think that's fine. But I don't think that necessarily... But, but I, the other thing I would say is that Judeja and Ashwin have been bowling on wickets where literally they just come in and the ball pings sideways. And they had to put more 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 rotations on the ball. They had to think about things a little bit more. You know, Judeja at times in this series got whacked around a little bit as well, right? And, and that's just a different situation for them. Um, and then also just the baseball nature of uh, it's a it's not you're not bowling against test batting right it is it is a different situation to be in for a, for a top player but he came back and was magnificent in the second part of the series yeah and I mean uh, initially I felt like England's plans versus India's spinners they were on point you know they had completely got into their heads even and. And they won that test match uh, by playing peak baseball cricket. But then over the course of, you know, five test matches, oh, your light's gone. Oh, you're back. Don't worry. Don't worry. There's <laughs> something going wrong with my camera. I'm just trying to fix it live on air. There's nothing All to right. see here. <laughs> but yeah, over the course of five test matches, they completely had England's number. And I mean, if 16 wickets in the last test are falling to Kuldeep and Ashwin, then clearly, uh, you know, they came up trumps. If we talk about England's batters, uh, you know, they haven't particularly performed well, barring Zach Crawley, who once again got a score in this test match, mm -hmm. 79. And I think he has the most 50-plus scores in a uh, test series in India now, um, ever, I think, alongside like a few more people. I'm not quite sure on this record, but there is some sort of record that he broke. And uh, Joe Root also got some runs in this test match. He scored 84 in the third innings. But those two guys were the only two batters who crossed 50 in this entire test match. If you look at the whole series, Pope and Duckett, they did well in patches. But overall, what do you think just went wrong with England's batting as a whole? Uh, look, I think Duckett and Crawley got them off to great starts. I think Duckett's overall figures probably don't look as good as as they should have um, because, you know, it's kind of one big innings. But if you think back the amount of times that, you know, <laughs> the amount of times that India was shook by the partnership at the top and he was generally the more explosive player in, in those. So he played a big part in that. Once Ashwin worked him out or not even worked him out, was just allowed to bowl to him early on. It was a little bit different. Um, so I would say Crawley and Duckett were fine. Root, my guess is, and I haven't looked at this exactly, but my guess for Root is that, they bowled him into the dirt for two and a half test matches. And then he started making runs when he didn't have to bowl all the time. Yeah. It's hard to be. Made all... that point. You know, that's, that's, you're not the first person to say that. A lot of people were saying, if you wanted a genuine all-rounder, why did you pick Joe Root for that job? Because he's your premier test batter and run scorer. And on, you know, Indian surfaces, he's a good sweeper of the ball. He plays spin well. You want him to do the bulk of the scoring. And he only got, what, two scores at the end? I'll yeah, and one of them, and one of them was when the series was over, right? Like, yeah. that's that's not disrespecting the fact that he had to go out there and make runs, and, and, and but the series was over um, when he when he made that second score. So, so yeah, so if I I think Root, it'd be interesting to see if you played that series again and he didn't have to bowl, um, mm. how many runs he would have made. It might not make any difference at all. It might just be a um, coincidence, but that's how it felt to me watching it. Yeah. Duckett and Crawley are fine. Pope is what we thought he was, right? Like he he managed in one test 
to get away with it and play a high risk game that really worked for him. And then he never did. And and the, the, the other problem with Pope is I think he's a nervous starter and he's terrible at starting against two spinners. So you're kind of combining the two things he's not very good at all together. Yeah. And um, so someone, uh, I can't remember, maybe someone tweeted this, might've been my, uh, Wagner in, in um, not Wagner. Um, oh my God, I've forgotten the guy's name. Uh, the New Zealand um, statistician who sometimes uh, tweets things. Who, Apologies, I can't remember your name, but um, <laughs> uh, he he tweeted a list of players who are very very good uh, once they get set, and and you know it's that getting to that twenty five, and you know I, I I sort of grew up watching Dean Jones, so you know he's a perfect example, and Kane Williamson is another one, and I think Ollie Pope is one of those players again. You know, Marcus North was another one. You, you get some of these guys who just it's just the start. If they can get past twenty, chances are you might as well you know back them to make a hundred. Um, because they will go on and be very, very good. And Pope is that kind of player, I think. But I think it's worse in Asia because he can't play spin. It just he doesn't understand it. He, he doesn't it's just not natural to him in the way that he bats. Um, and then on top of that, usually it's the spin I think that's turning away from him that causes him problems. But I think Ashwin is in his head. So he, there's he's got he's got Ashwin at one end, um, and he's got. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Jadeja at the other. And then in this series, by the end, he also had Cool Deep, who he couldn't yeah. pick. So there's three spinners that ha he all has individual issues with, right? And you know, how he gets over this, I don't know. It, it's a real question mark going forward. Most of us have thought that he's not a number three. The problem is, this is the same issue that England's always had, that everyone is really uh, five, six, seven in their team. You know, go back to the Moe and Ali, Joss Butler days where like, literally every dude in their team could bat five, six, seven. That's absolutely great. But unfortunately, some people are going to have to bat three, right? And 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 uh, that seems to be a bigger issue for them. The other guys, I thought Besto saw the ball fine, but this is he's a perfect example of, like, he's still sledging when they've lost the series and he's gone out. Like, clearly lost his mind, right? Like, with all due respect to, to, to Johnny, I, I love the way he plays his cricket because... He's got so many holes in his game. And he's like, I don't care. I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to play my way. And we have seen him be absolutely magnificent at his best, right? His peak is so high and his floor is so low, right? And we know that. But like if you're sledging when you've lost, when you're about to lose 4-1 and you've just been dismissed and you're sledging a bloke who made 100, what are, what are we doing here? What, what are we even talking about, right? Yeah. Um, just absolute. And, you know, he's still having to go at Gill as he's walking off the field. Like it's just like I, I don't understand it. Uh, Stokes can't play spin in Asia. I was mm. pretty sure of that before. I feel even more so now. I think India is a hard place, but these weren't the hardest wickets to bat on, I think, yeah. to play spin. And Ben Folks, I think, tries really hard, but essentially Ben Folks can't put any pressure back on anyone, right? So it, it's really interesting to me that by the end, Besto had a horror series and still averaged more than Folks, who faced like twice as many deliveries as it. Um, yeah. You know, so... Uh, I, there's a lot of people who love Ben Folks' as batting. I've said for a long time it was limited. He looks really limited in this particular series. So that has been their strength, right? Hmm. The top order has been a fucking dumpster fire, right? We know that. We're aware of that. But it's been that four, five, six, seven that yeah. has carried them, even in baseball. Hmm. Even as Crawley has been good and Duckett's done well, you know, it's still been that middle order that everyone's terrified of. Yep. They bowled one of them to death. Another one was so convinced he had to hit every ball for six that it didn't look like he could stay out there all that long. Uh, another one has a weakness against spin that he couldn't overcome in this particular series. He's got a couple of you know balls that get low, but I think that's I, I, I think if we think about Ben Stokes that way, we're being a little bit too friendly because I don't think he was playing spin particularly well, even when that wasn't happening. And then Ben Folks unable to put the pressure back on. That's the strength that they usually have in their batting order, and all of it didn't work. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. I definitely concur. And uh, even in, like you mentioned, the test matches in which baseball was successful, it's that middle order to lower middle order which basically won them those games for the most part. As mm -hmm. good as Crawley and Duckett have been as an opening pair, that wasn't their secret sauce. It was no. the other guys. A and the, the depth that comes with England and all of that stuff. I, I think, think at its best so far when when, when the, that sort of baseball theory has worked is you kind of look at Crawley and, and Duckett, like um, uh, like a three pointer, uh, like a bunch of three pointers in basketball, or like a bunch of home runs in baseball. In that, if if those guys come off, you should be almost unbeatable, 
right? Because you know you have the backbone behind them, but you're not really expecting them to come off. You're actually kind of expecting it not to work perfectly. And then for the middle order to come in and do their work. If, if you look at that New Zealand series, which started this all, it was like, you know, the batting started when Bairstow came out like half the time, right? It was Root or Bairstow and then Stokes that did it. And Root, Bairstow and Stokes have all had poor series. Like yeah. Root's average is what, 40 in this series at the end? Am I, uh, 35, 40, whatever it was. That's not what we expect from, uh, from from Root on wickets where it wasn't ragging. If it's ragging and he'd average this, we'd all be giving him medals. But it's not. And so he didn't have the impact that he needed to have. I think that's the main takeaway over here, that these surfaces, or at least for the most part that we've seen in these in this five-match test series, has not been like you know akin to Indian surfaces over the last half decade. This was different. You know, the batters were in the game for quite a lot of it, which is why I feel like England's batters have really let them down. Coming to India's batters, of course, in this game, India scored 477, which was the only time that they batted. And everyone got a score. Rohit and Gill scored tons. Jaiswal, Padikal and Safaraz, they scored half centuries. And this might have just been their most dominant performance as a unit all series. Yeah, it was. I found it re really interesting that even within that, England found a couple of times, like, had a couple of moments where they kind of tripped them up a little bit. Uh, you know, they had they had that uh, those two sort of micro collapses in the middle of all that. But this is kind of how we expected India to bat against Hartley and Bashir and yeah. and Mark Wood and those sorts of guys, right? Like, it, and it was the first, and it was like right at the end of the series that we kind of saw it the way that it was supposed to be. Um, and you know, just while kind of not carried them, but certainly was a huge factor in uh, in in the early part of this series. I mean, and we. In the last few uncovered or sorry overthrows episodes, we've been talking about his run tally. He ended with 712 runs in the series, so 250 odd below the dawn's record. But still, that's fantastic. This kid is what 22, and he's already scored a thousand Test runs and 712 runs in five Test matches is still a fuck ton. Equal second quickest uh, to to a thousand Test runs. Um, there's yeah. a bunch of players, but really good players on that list, and 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 Jai Swell's there. Obviously, Bradman's at the top of that again. But but yeah, so this is this is kind of how I thought they should have batted in that first Test when they had a chance to 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 win it. And if you go through, probably first Test, second Test, fourth Test, there were so many times they could have just batted England out of the game, and they never managed to. And, and this was the this was the time they did, but they still. And this is a credit to the thinking and the strategy of England rather than the talent of England. On pretty good batting wickets all the way through, India never got that 550 knockout yeah. kind of blow. And it does tell you, everyone's like, oh, pass ball's failing. And it's like, we're watching a really terrible bowling attack keep India in check with incredible players right and, and maybe maybe that's different if Virat and, and KL are there and and you know or, or Rishabh Pant maybe they would have got those 550 scores but the players who came in looked pretty good um and, and so you know you look at that Shubman Gill wicket of Anderson that's perfect basketball cricket of just like we are just going to get in your head until this is an ego thing Jai Swell versus Hartley I don't know if there was any sledging involved with that but again Jai Swell should have made 300 in this innings right like what are you what not, not against Hartley against Bashir sorry like why are you running down the wicket to that ball you don't have to you, you've been smacking him everywhere and and I think that is what England is very good at but they have to be very good at that because you know they I mean by the end Hartley looked exhausted um I mean he's obviously he's he's obviously not the most astute man on the top of his head um as it is but my god he was you know he looked like his own father by the end of that series he was so tired so drawn out right like uh you know and he's never he's never been in a situation like this the same with Bashir these yeah. guys and I just mean numbers of overs as much as anything else like and back to back and, and mean, everything else Bashir bowled what 46 overs yes took a fifer but went for 170 odd runs and that's still good because he's still just a kid but you know after this India series when are we going to see him again because he doesn't seem like the sort of spinner that England are going to field in home test matches at the, as their frontline spinner so now there's going to be this long pause in which he doesn't play any test cricket for England and the last memories he'll have are these memories in India in which he did all right he was okay and he, he held his own, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, he held his own. Yeah, no, no. I, I, that that's the big question, right? Because yeah. they don't play. Because the only, well, obviously, they're gonna they'll use him if they play India again. They'll probably take him to Bangladesh. They'll probably take yeah. him to Sri Lanka. But they're not playing 
those places, those teams over there for a while. So the next away series, the next away series is in Asia is Pakistan. Yes. I don't really see him as a Pakistan. I like him and Hartley. I think I'm not sure that either of them are accurate enough to bowl in in Pakistan because the, Leach is going to be back hopefully, and they'll really yeah. want Leach to be back. So Leach will come back. Um, it would be very, very interesting to see how all that goes. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure Hartley, because of the all-round package, might be there. But you're right. I'm, I'm not really sure how that works overall. So how do they develop him from here is a really, really interesting one. Yeah, it's huge. And uh, speaking of youngsters, of course, you mentioned the fact that there was no Virat Kohli in the series. KL Rahul, I think, just played the first test and then we didn't see him again. And of course, Rishabh Panth has been injured for quite a while. So this was technically depleted India and we mm. didn't really feel that. Yes, sure, they didn't make those 550 scores, but you know they ultimately won the series 4-1 and dominated a couple of those test matches in which they were going to be clear winners. Shubman Gill is the final person I want to talk about before we move on from this segment. Yes, Jaiswal scored 712 runs in the series and is the leading run scorer, yada, yada, yada. Second highest run scorer with 452 runs is Shubman Gill. And I think after the second test match, was it? Everyone was calling for his head and now he's come up trumps and, you know, is one of the first names on the team sheet because number three is pretty much the hardest place to bat for a test match batter as is. So it's been quite the turnaround and I personally love it. Do you know, the interesting thing for me is that Matt Henry was terrible for New Zealand in test matches for, I don't know, first 10 or 15 tests of his career. But because it's New Zealand and there's no professional full-time cricket writers who just were right on cricket, uh, you can kind of be bad on social media. Maybe there's a few people moaning about him and maybe some talk back on, on you know, SEN or whatever the other sports radio station was, um, if it still existed when Matt Henry was playing bad. But um, no one really noticed. But it's like, well, wait a minute. Matt Henry's incredible in these other, in this other format. We know how good he is. Surely there's going to be a regression back to him being better in test cricket. Like, we could see that the skills should translate. They're just not translating. And Shubin Gill's the exact same. And, you know, I was asked about that. And I, I could see how he could have been dropped after that second test. But I was also saying, like, he's not a normally talented player. And it, exactly the same of, of Matt Henry. You look at those records and you go... We, we're going to need to. We're going to need to be in a situation where we're absolutely positive that this person has a flaw that won't work in Test cricket. And I'm not talking about the fact that he struggles when the ball comes back into him a little bit, because everyone's got those sorts of basic flaws. Yeah. But you know, I mean, uh, like a really tragic flaw. And there was nothing in Shubman <laughs> Gill's game that suggested that. And so I and, and I understand it. But but it, it was very laughable to me that in this week we've seen both of those players sort of, or sorry, over the last couple of weeks, I should say, both of those players absolutely explode back in, right? Uh, uh, you know, I, Matt Henry has been doing it for a little while, of course, but Shub McGill coming back because that's why you keep picking players like that, right? Exactly. If, uh, you know, you don't want to get into a situation as a selecting um, committee where you pick a player, they don't work for two test matches, then you take them out and then you bring them back in because I tell you what, that's just a natural variation. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, what they did with Rajat Padadar to me suggests that this Indian selecting committee and Raul Dravid and whoever else has evolved, Rohit Sharma, is quite mature because they are like, no, we still believe in Padadar, right? Him failing in a couple of test matches doesn't mean anything, right? And we have seen that, you know, Padadar's start to his career was a little bit unlucky, but, you know, you want to compare it to Marvin Adipatu or Graham Gooch or Ken Rutherford, we've seen players literally <laughs> be horrible horrendously bad at the start of their careers. And yeah. so Padadar had a little bit of uh, bad luck and didn't do it. So if you've got Shubman Gill and he's got, what, the highest batting average in the history of ODI cricket still, does he? He must be close anyway. Yeah. And you're not going to throw him away. You're just not in a position where you're going to be able to do that. And I think that's the, that is the smarter option. That is not what fans want. Fans want the next 20-year-old prodigy to come in and make a 1,000 runs in nine matches like Jaiswal. But <laughs> Jaiswal, what if Jaiswal had come in and not made any runs when he started? Yeah. Kimo, Kimo Roach could have worked him over in the first couple of games. He then went to South Africa and didn't, and didn't look great. And maybe he got sucked in against England and kept trying to run down the wicket and slog and, and not make runs. That wouldn't make me really think all that much differently of Jaiswal because I could see the, the way he sees the ball, the way his feet go, the way he picks battles that he needs to do. It's clearly he's a next level talent, right? Those are the ones you don't want to stuff up. 
Yeah, I mean, when you have generational talent at your disposal, like Jaiswal and Shubman Gill, which you know, as you, as you call them, S tier level players, you know, or, or youngsters, you just have to give them that sort of time. And you know, India played Chiteshwar Pujara in that number three role for years on years on years. Yeah. This was Shubman Gill's first year. He just got that gig when they went to West Indies, right? When Jaiswal debuted. So give this like ten test matches, and you just have to trust both the process and you know these players that they'll be able to crack this format and execute their skills to perfection which now they're coming to that point where it mm. seems like yes the future is now you know and uh, yeah i mean that's why they're the two highest scorers in the series but anyway i think that's enough on india and england let's take a short break you're watching uncovered with jared and viram stay tuned we'll be back after this ad thanks to the kind folks at flexi spot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their e7 pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button you don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro Chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today. Welcome back to Overthrows. You guys are with Behram and Jared and we've got a fair few comments. A lot of you have questions, but we have a lot to cover as well. So if you really want something answered, send us a super chat and we'll definitely take that one on. Coming to New Zealand versus Australia. Australia have won the second test at the Hagley Oval in Christchurch by three wickets. So this one could have gone the other way, but it hasn't. And Australia have swept the two-match series versus their trans-Tasman rivals yet again. And Jared, the last time New Zealand won a test match versus Australia was 2011 Hobart. And the last time they won versus Australia in their own backyard at home was in March 1993. And that is just astounding. Yeah, I don't think they were a pretty, pretty, very good side in 1993. Either. I think that was just at the period where the great side was breaking up. Um, and they Danny were about Morrison to get... was yeah. the player of the match. Yeah, so that was one. Um, I think me and Danny might have talked about that test. Um, he didn't win a lot of tests in the back half of his career. And that was certainly one of them. But um, look, they... I don't know what to say. It was stumps on day one. And what did they make? They made about 160. Does that sound right? 162. They made 162. And Australia were, I want to say, about 120 for four with it, with Lion in as Nightwatch, right? And I went and checked the odds, and they were nine to one New Zealand. And I was like, well, I'm going to take some of that because that is ridiculous, <laughs> right? And, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to watch the series. I sorry the test because I was working like kind of opposite hours, um, but I was like that doesn't make any sense to me those odds at all. But that's because just no one expects them to beat them, right? Yeah. And the thing that well no one will remember is that they're a nine to one shot who worked their way back into incredible favoritism in this game, especially when Australia were what seventy seven for four over nine on at the end of day three or day four whenever it was, um, and yet they've still got themselves in a position where they haven't won. And you know I, I don't. It's funny, you know, McCullum is, is the guru of English cricket and being a guru of IPL teams and goes around the world. He didn't fix this, mm -hmm. right? This issue existed when he was there as well for all the great stuff that McCullum did. It was one of the reasons that, that Australia thought it was hilarious when England started copying New Zealand. They were like, but we don't lose to New Zealand. Why would you copy New Zealand? Now, in the end, it turned out that England copying New Zealand style was pretty clever and, and won them a couple of World Cups. But... You can understand at the time why the Australians were like, what the hell? Why would you do this? But I, I, I have no answer for it. Uh, what I would say is it was a really, really good comeback. And I thought they did very, very well to get themselves into a position to win. But they didn't win, mate. So yeah. th it's the same thing over and over again, right? And uh, it's it's tough, but that's just the world that they live in. They, You know, sometimes, sometimes I wonder if this isn't a really good moment. Because it would be hard for them to argue when, when talking amongst themselves that they weren't in a really good position to win this test and draw this series, right? And they'll also be in a position of being like, there's something wrong. There is clearly something wrong when we play this side that doesn't exist with other teams. And what is it? And how do we get on top of it? And I, I don't know if it's, it, as I said before, if, if it's not because of the 1993 thing, it's like those players weren't. Some of these players weren't even alive when mm -hmm. when this started, right? So, I I never get these multi generational things and how they work. But it really does take someone to upset 
you know, the way that they think about cricket a little bit. And if McCullum couldn't do it, I don't know who the person is who's going to be able to do that for them, right? Yeah, I think that's uh, quite uh, candid and honest. And uh, maybe some soul searching is required for New Zealand. Gary Stead and Tim Southie can maybe sit down and have a chat about it. And well, maybe Bob Kane in it as well. I don't hasn't Southie sure. hasn't Southie said he might be leaving? He might not captain mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, I mean, and, and when I asked him this question when New Zealand came to Pakistan uh, start of uh, last year, I asked him Southie that look, you're at the back end of your career anyway, and you're in this World Test Championship cycle. So what's the plan over here? Like, what's the succession plan? How long do you continue or intend to continue captaining New mm. Zealand in test matches? And he did not have an answer then. And now he's gone on and said this. So kind of makes sense and kind of puts everything, like it puts a dark cloud over New Zealand's test cricket, right? Because here was a team which was very consistent, mm. had a golden generation which delivered. And now all of a sudden they're kind of falling off the rails. So the Sally thing is really interesting from a captaining. Um, so... We know that the reason that bowlers don't captain in test cricket is largely because of the class system in England and batters were, mm. batters were upper class and bowlers were professionals. But the problem with having a captain in, in test cricket specifically who, um, who's a bowler, other than just the niggles and the injuries and they, they miss more games than, than most batters do, is the fact that when a bowler drops off, it's usually a lot faster. Right, batters have a slower decline at the end of their career, and bowlers can have like a really, you know, the Jason Gillespie one is one of the most famous ones, right? Of just being like, might be one of the best bowlers in the world. He shouldn't be playing. Uh, he, you know, he looks like a third change first class bowler. Might be you know, one of the best bowlers in the world, and is now the best night watchman in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> and it'd be really interesting to see if that is playing a part also in, in Saudi. But you're right. You know, they had that golden generation. They played brilliantly. You know, I've done whole podcasts with Jeremy Coney. You know, a few few weeks ago. You know, talking about that team quite in depth and what what they achieved and everything. And now, it's falling apart. And we know there's talent there. You know, they've still what in the last couple of years they've found Conway, Latham. No, not Latham. Uh, Blundell, Con Conway, Blundell, Ravindra, Mitchell, Daryl Mitchell, yeah, yeah, like that's and and Jameson, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Glenn Glenn Phillips is finally Glenn looking like he's he's maturing as well or, or working his yeah. game out a little bit more as well. Like, but at the same time, that kind of core of having Saudi Wagner Bolt, you know, we I think I, I remember when Jameson came on board. And I think it was Shane Jurgensen was their bowling coach, a former Shield cricketer, who said, this is the best four-person quick bowling lineup in the world. And and I just don't think we'd given even the three-man before Jameson had come in enough credit. And now that is breaking down, right? You know, Wagner is is no longer there. We don't know how often Bolt will, will play in the future. Saudi, right as we're looking at him at the moment, looks very, very tired. Yeah. Um, Jameson, we don't even know how much he's going to play. And mm -hmm. so all that batting talent's really, really handy, and it probably kept them in this game. But in the but end, they needed I'll, the bowlers to finish it, didn't they? I'll challenge you over there. Go. In the third innings, right, when they were batting, four of those guys uh, in New Zealand's batting lineup, and all four, or well, at least three of those four are seasoned professionals now and, and regulars in the team. Tom Latham, he scored 73, I think. Uh, Kane scored a 50. Rachin Ravindra, okay, fine. He's not experienced, but he scored 82. And then Daryl Mitchell got 58 as well. Four of these guys have crossed 50, and two of them have nearly scored tons. Even if one of those guys went you know, a bit deeper and got a big score, this was game, set, match for New Zealand. And I feel like that is a missed opportunity in the context of this game for New Zealand. Yes, but remember that they did all that batting from 100 runs behind. Mm -hmm. So... It is a different psychological situation. I mean, is that that's probably the biggest innings in this game. So I can't. I find it hard to blame the batters who and, and the, the pitch was flattening out. I mean, you're right. There were set guys who should have gone on. I thought, you know, Williamson got a really, really good ball from Cummins. You know, was late on day two, was it? Um, uh, but but yeah, I think you know they certainly got themselves into a position uh, to be able to win that. But. Uh, you know, the bowlers, what were they, 77 for five? Am I remembering my maths right? Um, I mean, spare a thought for Matt Henry. Nine wickets in the game, seven for in the first innings. Was brilliant in the first test match. He actually ended with player of the series award. He took 17 wickets in two test matches and 101 runs as well with the bat. I don't think I've ever seen this, that a team gets whitewashed and yep. their player is a player of the series, right? I, I, have you? Can you but, but, one? Uh what happened in Andy Flower series when India 
uh, all those years back. But yeah, I can't remember. Um, yeah. But but you look at this the bowling card and you watch you know the bits of you know I saw key sessions and and quite a few of the highlights. It looked like they had a one person bowling attack, hmm. right? And the the batting got them back into the game after that original stuff up. And the batting has been an issue for a long time. But at least we know that there is. We know that Ratcha Ravindra is coming through. We know Daryl Mitchell's not going to retire anytime soon. And Devin Conway was desperate to get back into that siding. Maybe Glenn Phillips, um, you know, um, evolves into what they need him to be. Who who was their second best bowler in this game? From what you saw, I think. Um, well, uh, Ben Sears was good. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Sears was fine. I would say Ben Ben Sears was fine. Ben Sears is probably you want him to be your sixth best bowler. And I would say in this game, he's their second best bowler, right? Yeah. Now, he might de- he might continue to develop because I thought there were certainly plenty of signs that, that he did well. Um, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit maybe a little bit too slow overall. Um, but, you know, he's a decent, decent enough professional cricketer. But that's the situation that they're in at the moment. So they've gone from arguably the best three-man attack, mm-hmm. certainly the best four-man pace attack, to yes. Ben Sears. Right, and like that it's four-man test match attack that, that that won them the World Test Championship. If you really think that, about it, that's right? what I'm saying. That's that. So that's what they were great at, and then they had enough good batting around them, and, and some really great batting, of course. But you know, Taylor and Watling and Williamson and all that. I think they've kind of, you know, with with Blundell and and Ravindra and and, and Mitchell and those guys, they can replicate the batting again, maybe different in a different style, but they can replicate parts of the batting. But if Jameson isn't fit and Trent Bolt doesn't play anymore and, and Southie has, you know, slightly slipped back, I don't know, if Kugelin's in your best four bowlers, um, you're probably not going to take a lot of test match wickets, I wouldn't have thought. And, and so that's that's the issue I think that they have going forward. Yeah, and Wagner ball is also gone. Uh, there was like this, they hinted towards bringing him back for this test match, but that didn't end up happening. But uh, anyway... You spoke about how New Zealand, you know, fought back really well in this test match. Well, they were in a position where they should have absolutely won it. Australia yeah. were five down for 80. They needed 200 more runs to win the test match. And that's where Mitch Marsh and Alex Carey, they partnered up. And they scored briskly. It was, you know, classic counter-attack. And Marsh got 80. And of course, he's had his moments over the last year, won his medals and all of that. But Alex Carey... He remained unbeaten on 98 and he kind of took Australia over the line. And, you know, he hasn't had the year that Mitch Marsh has had. So this was an extremely important innings for him. Yeah, it's one of those innings that might actually end up confusing Australia quite a bit. Um, because uh, where, where's their next tour? Is it... Oh, my God. Why uh, They've got to go to Sri Lanka, don't they? Yeah. At one stage during this World Test Championship. Can you take Alex Carey to Sri Lanka with how he's played spin? It's true. Right? And coming into this test match, um, he had, what, 150 runs in seven innings, I want to say, off the top of my head? Something like that. I remember one good innings versus Pakistan, and that might have been it in this summer. Yeah. Was that a 50? Or... I don't think that was a big score either, was it? I'm trying to remember. Maybe it was, it was a 50. A clutch score. It was a clutch score. Yeah, yeah. He's actually The interesting thing about him is he's played some really important innings at and and I've we've seen this in his one day career. And I I don't think he's a particularly good white ball player, but he's he's played some really important innings when all things are falling apart around him. Yeah. But his ability to make consistent scores he doesn't have. So mm. he's now smashed this score. They have to take him um, to Sri Lanka, and chances are he won't get a cracker again because you know he's got a touch of the Ollie Popes about the way he plays spin. So it, it's it's one of those situations where the uh, you know I think they were going to make a move. Um, and they were gonna, and they were gonna get rid of him and bring someone else in. But now, I, I, I would suggest that uh, it would be very hard to drop him <laughs> based on the yeah. back of that particular innings. So, yeah, all credit to him, right? Like that he does that. But it, I, do, I do think it causes a bit of an issue, really. You know. But the the other thing I would say is that sort of Travis Head, Mitch Marsh, um, Alex Carey, mm-hmm. triumvirate in that middle or lower middle order is. It's a really, really powerful um, thing. And it, the weird thing about that is it does actually kind of replicate what England had in yeah. baseball, which yeah. is that, yeah, that ability of if the top three or four can um, you know negate the, the ball and it gets a little bit softer, it stops swinging or whatever, 
you've then got you know three guys in a row who could score really really quickly later on that didn't happen in this game because in this innings of course because no one made any runs at the top of the order but but I, I, you can actually see that falling apart and uh, falling into place which is quite funny of course because like australia's like baseball's all nonsense and it's like <laughs> have you not assembled a very similar kind of baseball lineup here guys um yeah. but also all credit to pat cummins what's that the third really important or mm. fourth really important innings that he's batted in a long fourth. time so yeah, i want to say fourth there was one was that edge test match, yeah right? maxwell then we had that uh, maxwell afghanistan game was and there one against west indies I think there was one against West Indies, wasn't it? Uh, or at least there was one in this Australian summer. I remember talking yeah. about this not too long ago. And now we have another score in which he remained not out on 32. Look, Australia still needed 59 runs to win when they lost their seventh. And Alex Carey was batting and all of that. But yeah. Pat Cummins, you know, he's come at this exact situation and sometimes even worse and just not given his wicket away. And then on top of that, he took four wickets in New Zealand's second innings as well. So yeah. he's having the time of his life, really. He, he is Mr. Clutch, if we're talking about Clutch. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, he's um, batting in that... Um, mm. Sorry, his, his wicket is probably what has kept them in the game. Uh, the one of Williamson, because I think they really could have scored uh, you know, a big amount if that wasn't... Uh, you know, if that doesn't happen. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's... It's very interesting, but but you're right. Like he just, it just feels like he's batting, and it's all why I find this really funny, is because this has all happened after he's demoted himself, yeah. right? So like he's literally put Mitchell Stark up ahead of him, um, and then found himself in a position where now he's batting in a way that he's probably batting better than Mitchell Stark. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, six to four not out against West Indies. That was the one we were thinking about. That's so, the one. Yes. So. That's four pretty I can't remember in what situation I'm just having a look at the scorecard there. Yeah, so they were they were massively out of that game, weren't they? That's right. They were behind. They were 100, 161, 161 for seven, chasing 311 when he came in in that game. Hmm. And he made 64 not out, um, which allowed them to get into a position to eventually um uh uh lose that game, but almost almost win that game, of course. Yeah. Um uh, but yeah, just uh it's r miraculous what he's been able to do with the bat and look I i've written about his batting so much because i've always been fascinated with it and i remember talking to him when he was 21 22 i can't remember what what year it was but it was when we were making the documentary and like we interviewed him for an hour but then i just chatted to him for a while is because just a good guy to talk cricket to and he was really young and he's you know he's probably excited no one had asked to interview him in a while because he was wasn't quite the flavor of the month because he was about two years out of the australian side yeah. and he was just talking about how much he worked on his batting and i remember him batting at number six in a in a, um in a game for the sydney thunder and they were trying to make him into a number six he does have a lot of basic batting talent available to him um and we see this sometimes when people become captains mm. you know i call it, you know it, the, the best three examples of this a uh, heat streak um imran khan and daniel vittori of like you become a captain and you just instantly become a little bit better of a batter just because like suddenly that they, it means a little bit more to you um when you go out to bat than it did beforehand and those other three guys we talked about you know he streak kind of on the verge of being an all-rounder the other two obviously definitely all around us but there was a bump there and i remember um amol dacey when we were, we were doing this years ago was saying that the, the trend that both of us saw was that bowling captains usually got better with the bat when they took over um, and and the bigger reason for that is just because they probably had to take it seriously, and Pat Cummins seems to be following you know that that uh, that pattern. Yeah, it's very interesting because you know Pat Cummins in a lot of these innings that we've mentioned has been like you know uh, a perennial blocker, and he's just mm. put a really high price on his wicket and not thrown it away. Whereas the Pat Cummins we knew with the bat prior to him being captain was someone who would have a slog and hit a few big ones, right? So it's that evolution that I really enjoy. And, and I do think there's a lot of truth to this notion that having that extra responsibility as captain is the reason why these knocks are coming out. So good on him. Fantastic job. But I do think that in this last, you know, uh, little bit, let's say off, since after they've won the World Test Championship, I don't think Pat Cummins has been their best pacer. I believe that's been Josh Hazelwood. He's been getting yeah. wickets in heaps. And this innings as well, or, or the first innings in this test match, he got that Pfeiffer that derailed New Zealand, right? And ultimately, if you look at this entire test combined, if Australia hadn't gotten New Zealand out at, on 162 odd, well, then the result might have been different. So credit to the Hoff, who, you know, it's throughout like 
the last half decade or so, ever since these guys have been bowling together, when you take their names, you always go like Stark, Cummins, Hazelwood, or Cummins, Hazelwood, Stark. And all of a sudden, Josh Hazelwood is performing better than both of those guys. And I think that's a massive compliment. Do you know, he, he spent a couple of years trying to get better at white ball cricket and he did it off his own back. Cricket Australia didn't really want him to. They didn't pick him for a World Cup at one stage and all sorts of things were going on. But I think he thought for his bank balance as much as anything. And, you know, he wanted to go off and do it. And I do think there was a slight regression in his red ball cricket around that period, which, which makes sense. He was, wasn't spending as much time thinking about it. And I just think since then, he's worked out how to marry the two together a little bit more, would be, would be my guess. Uh, but yeah, he was absolutely fantastic. No doubt about that. Yeah. All right. We've got a super chat. Soham Bhattacharya says, Hi, Jared and Behram. Hello to you, Soham. Why do a lot of ex-players say that you can't coach express pace into a bowler? What is it about bowling fast that is biological and inherent instead of being a learnable skill? That's a pretty good question. I I'll just give it to Jared. Take it away. MRF uh, Academy, Jared Kimber. <laughs> uh, Behram, you bowl seam, don't you? Yes, I do. Would you consider yourself a fast twitch muscle fiber athlete? I mean, I, when I was, what, 13, from that period to when I was 16, I felt like I'd gotten a lot more pace, and that's probably just because I was getting old. But also, there's one thing that I felt when I was consistently bowling, like, you know, on a regular basis, as opposed to, like, street cricket every now and then, my clicks were better. Like, I, I was bowling at a higher pace, just because, you know, the muscle memory and everything was, you know, on song and whatever. Didn't answer, like, you didn't answer my question at all. I'm not a Twitch bowler, no. Yeah, so... So if I work with Bayram and he's just explained one thing that's really interesting there, which is when his body was settled into a rhythm mm. and he understood bowling a little bit more and he did it regularly, he got a little bit faster, right? You can put on pace on bowlers. So Tim Southey is a perfect example of this. I thought there was a period in Tim Southey's career where he was just going to disappear because he was just so slow and teams had worked out how, how to play him. And Alan Donald gave him an extra, what it was at four or five kilometers. Um, to work with. Chris Wokes put on an extra four or five kilometers. So you can make bowlers slightly faster than they used to be. And, you know, there's the Stephen Jones style. Of style uh, there's the Ian Pont style. There's all these guys out there. And that's their job now, right? They make money working with bowlers and saying to them, if you do these things, we, you can put on four or five kilometers. What you can't do is put on 10 or 15 kilometers and turn yourself from a fast medium bowler to an express fast bowler. You can maybe go from fast, medium to the sort of underside of fast, right? But you can't skip a couple of le levels. And that is because it is an athletic endeavor and you need to have the, the incredible athleticism available to you to be able to get to that level. So what about you, um, Imran? Because I remember there's stories of him changing his action altogether and that way he became a fast bowler. So you can change your action. I would say that with Imran, it was probably more to do with the fact that he went back and played on flat decks. So, so there's been a couple of bowlers. So Stuart Broad's another example. Stuart Broad was a medium pacer um, and became a fast bowler. But uh, yeah. and, and and Darren Goff was another example. All right. So there's a couple of guys, but that was guys who were intentionally bowling within themselves because they had been taught to bowl within themselves because you know in, that was the skill that was needed. Like if you're if you're a seamer in Yorkshire, they don't want you to bowl 90 miles an hour. They want you to bowl a, uh, outswing at 82 miles an hour. Right. Yeah. You know if if you're if you're coming through the sort of lower end of county. Um, university cricket, which is where Imran Khan came through. Again, there's no reason for him to bowl 90 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> and Stuart Broad, again, was a batter who needed to bowl a little bit. They they would have said to him, you're really tall, mate. Just just bowl like um, Tom Moody or Jacob Oram. That's all we need you to be able to do. That's slightly different. Uh, the best case, the best story about that is Craig White. Do you remember the cricketer Craig White? I think I do. Yeah, he's da I think he's Darren Lehman's brother-in-law and he played for Yorkshire. And the story is he got hit in the head and came back as a fast bowler. <laughs> um, but if you look at Craig White bowling, he had this big slingy action. So he changed his action. So you, if you change your action or you change your intent, you might be able to unlock again another level. But you, you were talking about Imran Khan, Darren Goff, Craig White, um, and Stuart Broad. These are already incredible athletes hmm. right we're not doing this with ollie robertson right ollie robertson is not that kind of athlete you're not going to be able to make ollie robertson bowl consistently above 90 miles an hour perhaps if you work with him a lot you could get him to touch 90 miles an hour he'd never be consistently above that kind of mark because look at the kind of athlete he is he just doesn't have that physicality within him now 
there isn't one kind of physicality that makes you bowl fast. It's one of the really, really interesting things of fast bowling. Of You sort of had your, you know, Fidel Edwards sort of Lassif Malinga rubber type of guys, right, who, who bowl fast. And we've got history of those going back um, uh, in cricket. Then you have the sort of, what, Fred Truman, Ryan Harris sort of tank kind of guys, right? Yeah. Then you have someone like Brett Lee who, you know, just a natural athlete who could have played any kind of sport. You put Maybe you put someone like Jofra Archer in that kind of – that that kind of reign as well there's much many different kinds of athleticism the one thing that they probably all all um share is fast twitch muscle, muscle fiber which is what sprinters have right and if you look at the elasticity of of jeff thompson and Shaw Bakhtar, mm. right and they're probably the you know and and you put um uh, you know so there's probably some other bowlers in that kind of style again that athleticism that they have is what makes them bowl fast. Perhaps in, in Jeff Thompson's case, it was finding that slingy catapult type action, right? As well, um, which might have played a part in it. But but realistically, you can't make someone who is. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, the conversation. I think you might have told me this story the other day about was it Akram and Kuldeep Yadav? Yeah, I did. I was. Was it Akram took one look at Kuldeep Yadav and went, "Well, you were never going to bowl fast." And that is because he knew what he was looking for. And I remember the, talking to Roddy Eswick. The story, the story yeah. actually, I'm just going to repeat it for everyone who's over here, is that Kuldeep was a big fan of Wasim when he was growing up. So when he met Wasim in the KKR dressing room, he was like, when I was young, I wanted to be a fast bowler like you, a left arm pacer. And Wasim was like, well, I'm glad that you turned to spin. Otherwise, we would have never met. Exactly. <laughs> and I remember when... Um, uh, being with Roddy Eswick, who's obviously been West Indies coach for a long time and, uh, and I think coaches of franchises and stuff. It was a great first-class bowler himself. I remember him talking to me about Obed McCoy and everything he was talking about was athletic, right? So that is why um, that is why you are in a situation where those things happen. That doesn't mean that there aren't technical things that you can get extra pace. So it's, you know, you hear the fast bowlers when they commentate and go, if this guy had a braced front knee, he would bowl a little bit quicker. If this guy had a, a stronger front arm, he would bowl quicker. If he ran in directly rather than stuttering in his run up, those are all the things you can do to take yourself up a little bit. And maybe if you're a bowler who has like, and maybe Imran was one of these kinds of bowlers, I don't know. I, I know more about the other guys that we talked about before, but maybe there was a situation where Imran just had a bunch of things that were in, that he, he kept fixing and he could get to that upper level, but he still needed the athleticism of that upper level, right? I, I'm I'm quite athletic in in some ways. It certainly was when I was younger. None of that athleticism came to any pace at all. Didn't matter how fast I ran in, how perfect my technique was. I can swing the ball like you would not believe. I've got a great off cutter, but it's all coming to you at about seventy kilometers an hour, no matter what I do, right? It just I can't get any pace um, uh, through the ball. There is an athleticism there that I'm sure people could have got me to be a decent medium pace bowler because of all the other skills I had, but I was never going to be a fast bowler. Whereas Joffre Archer and Mitchell Stark were wicket keepers who were throwing the ball just for fun in the nets. And it was quite clear that their athleticism was more suited towards bowling 90 miles an hour than it was taking 90 miles an hour. Well, Soham, I hope that answers your question. We've got another super chat over here from Anish. He says, India have 50 international stadiums. Does any other country have a variety of pitches where it assists spin and fast bowling? The West Indies, maybe? Because yeah, West maybe Indies. Not 50. Yeah, not 50, but uh, they have the variety. Yeah, West Indies has way more variety than India. Um, yeah, it's yeah. not even close. Because so many of those Indian wickets are not assisting seam bowling whereas the West Indies has some of the quickest pitches in the world some of the bounciest pitches in the world they then have pitches with grass on them they then have Guyana which is like maybe the slowest lowest surface in the world yeah. like the variety in the West Indies is mad and I always thought that on top of the many different reasons the West Indies got good it was the variety in the first class wickets that really helped because when when cricket becomes an international sport their players were playing at home they were playing in England um, uh, and then eventually they would play in Australia uh, under Packer as well. They just had such an ad advantage over another. If you were an England player and you you know played counter cricket for years, and you got picked to play for England. If you hadn't played England A, you probably hadn't been on many tours of playing top level cricket. And so the West Indian players, even if they skipped the the county circuit or the league circuit um, and didn't play in the Packer series, just at home they had the option of playing in Guyana. And you know Guyana is. A Bangladesh pick wicket, really. Trinidad is probably more like a Sri Lankan wicket. Um, Jamaica can be both, 
um mm. well not not both it can spin and it can help and in those days the main wicket but it's when we talk about cricket we usually talk about the first class wickets the really interesting thing about west indies is that even on one island they have a multitude of different wickets available to them. They are built to be an academy system. Um, it, it's a remarkable situation uh, from that. So, no, uh, West Indies would have that. Modern day South Africa is really interesting because of global warming. A lot of their wickets have changed. So you have seeming wickets, you have slow wickets, you have spinning wickets, you have bouncing wickets, you have, you know, um, even paced wickets. So I'd say they'd have more variability now than India would have. Um, and I think... I suppose the old days of Australia would have been another one, which again yeah. might have been the reason why Australia was so good that you had proper spinning wickets, you had proper even wickets, you had pace wickets, you had uh, you had you had grounds that swung, you had grounds that seemed. Um, unfortunately, in the drop-in era of Australian wickets, they probably just become a little bit more the same. It's one reason why Australia has started using some of their outgrounds for first-class cricket more, um, because there is more variability in the outgrounds than there is in, in the main surfaces. Well, that, I think that was a fantastic question, Anish. Just before we end this segment, uh, Jared, you mentioned how Australia have a really interesting sort of, you know, batting order now. Your top three are run accumulators, which are not particularly worried about how quickly they play. Then you've got Cameron Green as a buffer in between who could play either way. And then you've got those, you know, Mad Max, Maverick sort of batters in Travis Head and Mitchell Marsh and now Alex Carey, followed by a really long tail because Stark is no mug with the bat and Cummins is undefeated, I suppose, in a chase. <laughs> but Manas was someone who was really struggling in this batting order, big time. Mm. He was really looking for a score in this Australian summer and failed. Uh, you know, he couldn't get much runs at all versus both of Pakistan and the West Indies. But now, in this test match, you know, Australia were only able to post a lead of about 100 runs because Manas scored that first innings 90. Big, big score for him, you'd have to say. No, I think so. Definitely. I think, I mean, that's probably the innings that it's got them by in that game. As, as I said, I, I put the bet on New Zealand at nine to one because I, I thought that Australia were in the game and it was, I sorry, that New Zealand were massively in the game, but it was Manus that almost kind of ended that, um, uh, situation and, and got them into position. A huge score for him. He's been averaging 30 for the last couple of years now after averaging 60 every year before that, right? So, you know, he's now in a situation where he's got to go and do that. And we've seen Manus and Baba Azam, two guys who kind of just, the wobble ball didn't bother them. And they, you know, they were just killing people. And and a lot of those, those runs were at home. Um, and also on top of that, um, you know, we know that Manus had some luck with being dropped. Although generally, if you make a lot of runs, you have luck with being dropped, but that's a different yeah. question there. Um, but I think teams are just a bit smarter in the way they bowl to him now. And, they, you know, they've worked him and Bubba out a little bit more. And it's up to those guys to come back. And and I think with that, Manus is, um, this is a really important innings. And it'd be, uh, it'd be very cool to see how he goes from there. Yeah. Would have been 100 as well, probably, if not for that Glenn Phillips, you know, screamer. Uh, one of, a catch. of the better catches, yeah, but one of the better catches I've seen recently. Um, but anyway, on that note, we'll end this segment. You guys are watching Overthrows with Jared and Behram. We'll be back after the short break to talk about Bangladesh versus Sri Lanka. Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you need to be just as careful with your computer's defenses as well. And for that, why not use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and four additional months for free. It's also completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Sounds like roaming slang, but it's not. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber. If you make a lot of content like me, you will need help. And that is why we use Minvo.pro, a slicing and dicing tool that uses AI to conjure up great clips from your podcast chats and meetings. If you make content, go to Minvo.pro to cut it. Welcome back to Overthrows. You guys are with Jared and Behram. And before we come and talk about Bangladesh versus Sri Lanka, we've got another super chat. So let's take that quickly, Jared. If you read um, it, I'll find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's by No Dogma. And uh, he's paid us two Canadian dollars. So thank you for that, No Dogma. And it's not even a question. It's just a suggestion, which we love, by the way. Uh, he liked the Crick Picks Cheaters episode. So the suggestion is to do one on umpires. Well, I'm not sure if we can do one worst umpires also. Um, yeah, you guys don't know things that might happen <laughs> in that cheaters episode. <laughs> but we'll, we'll yeah, the, le the legal team had to take out um, something that Bayram said from that one. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, the interesting thing about umpires is if you were actually doing worse umpires, you wouldn't know any of them, um, no dogma, because they would all be the ones before the international. I mean, Shakur people Rana, are like... number one. Yeah. Oh, Shakur Rana. Um, uh, I mean, you know, Daryl Hare, I suppose he's a little bit yeah. more famous. Um, but some of the Australian and the New Zealand umpires were absolutely I mean, horrendous. David Shepard's little skippy, skippy thing on the Nelson. That was weird. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, the umpires back in the old... And, and to be fair to those guys as well, they would get like one or two tests a year. They were quite often paid by the cricket boards that they were working for. And, and it was just, it was a terrible situation to be in. Like umpires, international umpires should not be paid by local boards to begin with. Um, and so, and then there was no cameras and everything else. But I, I've said this many times before. Um, if, if you want to see bad umpires, like people complain about umpiring now. I was like, you guys have no idea. Go and have a look at um, at uh, what's his name, uh, Bruce Reed. Um, I, I don't know if, if Ro Belinda's clips are still up, but the Bruce Reed um, uh, LBW mix, is, or just Bruce Reed's wickets to see some of the worst umpiring decisions you will ever see. Um, but yeah, modern umpiring nowhere near that level. I mean, that doesn't mean we don't have you know uh, Doc Drove and and uh, Paul mm -hmm. Rifle. I don't Joel think Wilson. A, a Joel, Joel Wilson has struggled a little bit, you know. Um, uh, Alan Dar towards the end of his career, Steve Buckner towards the end of his career, and they were both very good umpires when they were younger as well. Um, so yeah, you know, there's definitely that. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a a crick picks thing. I, I, maybe, maybe it is. I'll, I'll talk maybe, to it. Maybe best umpires is a good one. You know, it, it, it would be interesting as well. But um, it's a it, the, what I would say is there was a Rudy Gobert in the NBA the other day was complaining about the referees. And in it, he said, look, we all make mistakes. And it, and he talked about in the same game that he tried to do a dunk and he airballed a dunk. Now, I don't know how you do that when you've got like a nine foot wingspan like he does, right? But the point is, he was trying to make is the umpires do make mistakes uh, or the referees do make mistakes and the players make mistakes. And it seems to be that when an umpire makes a mistake, we, we focus on it a lot more. They, why should they be any more accurate than, uh, or any more consistent than any other human being on the planet? They should be exactly the same. So uh, I, I know how hard umpiring is, and I still think there are things that the ICC could do to make the system better, but, but I get it. Yeah, no, but I do think that Billy Doctorov and Joel Wilson are actually not up to you know, the mark when it comes to international elite level uh, umpiring. Uh, I just think the the ICC is crap the way that they deal with all this sort of stuff. They should just tell us what the stats are and we can have a look at it ourselves. If they've got stats to prove these guys aren't as terrible as we think, then show us yeah. and and shut us all up, right? Like the oh, ICC shit me to tears. You go to them about a decision, they'll be like, Jared, you know we don't speak about decisions. And I went, you know that that just means everyone's going to just badmouth you guys for days. Is that the better option here, really? <laughs> anyway. Seriously. Anyway, let's come to Sri Lanka versus Bangladesh. And Sri Lanka are touring Bangladesh currently. And the three-match T20I series is over. Bangladesh have lost the series by a margin of two games to one. And the first game of the series was a proper nail-biter. And Dasun Shanaka, he successfully defended 12 runs in the final over to give Sri Lanka victory by three runs. And for Bangladesh, it was senior pro Mahmudullah. I know you love him and he's come and scored a vital 50 again. He scored 31, uh, uh, 31 ball 54. And then the newcomer, Jakir Ali, he scored 68 of 34. I feel like Bangladesh should have won that game. I, I didn't see it at all. I, take, take me through it. I mean, uh, my big question for you on, in this sort of stuff is, did we learn anything ahead of the World Cup that we need to know? The, the young batter coming through seems like an interesting one for me. Yeah, but it doesn't, or well, his record doesn't really hold up. I did check it on Crick Info and everything. So, you know... Uh, if the young batter had been prolific in the build-up to him making his debut or whatever for Bangladesh and then come and scored, I would be more excited. Because with, let's suppose, uh, what's that guy's name? Tohid Ridhoi. There was so much to love about Ridhoi, right? That you were like, oh, you expect this guy to perform. With Jakir Ali, I feel like it might be a flash in the pan because I want to see more evidence. And what? Bangladesh, without Shakib, feel like a depleted sort of unit uh, to me. Because there was this other guy, a leg spinner who in one game took two for 35 and scored like 50 off 30 or something like that. I got excited. I was like, hey, maybe they found the next Shakib. Went and checked the record and this was the best game he's ever played in his life.
<laughs> well, the Jack Your Alley one was uh, is uh, funny because if I remember, I, I I didn't really follow this series. I'm just sort of starting to get back into the T20 space, and, and I'll go and look at all the highlights and the, the stats afterwards. But my memory of him is that in another game, he made like four or seventeen balls or something stupid. Um, so so it is it is a bit a little bit more random. What I like is that we are starting to see Bangladeshi batters come into international cricket and attack and play freely and and you know back themselves because I, I always thought that was the bigger issue it's like the talent is one thing but they all looked like all they could do is hit the ball to mid off and mid on over and over again and it's like that's really great but you can't do that in international cricket so we are seeing that side of things we, okay you've watched this series you've watched a little bit of this what what just do you little. yeah just a little bit what which team do you think is going to go further in the world cup I think Sri Lanka are definitely going further in the World Cup because if I look at Bangladesh, look, what were the big positives for them? Jakir Ali, again, I, I personally feel it's a flash in the pan sort of situation. The Rishad Hussain guy, the spinner I was talking about, he's 21. So maybe, just maybe, mm. there is time to develop him, right? If they have him and Mehdi in that lower middle order who are bowling four overs and batting quickly, I think that could be good for Bangladesh. But what I'm concerned about with respect, with respect to the Tigers, is that uh, Shanto is the captain. And as much as we love him, and as much as, as love... Uh, Be very uh, careful what you say yeah. here. On, on Uncovered and Overthrows, we've, we've always uh, adored Shanto and his arc has been very closely followed. And he even got an unbeaten 53 of 38 in the second game to help them win. That's, you know, uh, Bangladesh squaring the series right over there, courtesy of their captain. I just don't think he's the right man for the job in the shortest format. Because we know that he's not the most explosive batter around the block. Like, that's not his game. Yeah, I sup I mean, maybe they need... Uh, I, I don't know. I, you know I can't talk about Shanto um, yeah. <laughs> with any any kind of um, ob objective um, uh, way. I do think he can get into that other gear. But you're right. He's probably more suited to the one-day game and, yeah. the, and, and the test match game at the moment. Um, where uh so yes you're probably right but you know they do need it's weird to say this about a 25 year old who two years ago was the worst player in the world but they probably do need a couple of grown-ups around right um to to help out and uh i don't i don't know if he he'd have to be a pretty good tactical player to overcome the way he plays in t20 at the moment i think you're probably yeah. you're probably fair there yeah uh and why i think sri lanka are on to something is because uh well in this series, uh, Pathum Nisanka isn't even playing. But in the last one, we saw that he was doing well. That's mm. a good sign. The fact that Kusal Mendes has been a batter, batter reborn since the ODI World Cup, right? I think that is their biggest plus. He scored 59 of 36 in the first game, 36 of 22 in the second, and 86 of 55 in the third. That's two 50s and the most number of runs in this entire series also went away with the Player of the Series award. I feel like he has shifted that gear. And, you know, this new Kusal Mendes always goes at uh, a rate quicker than Kusal Mendes of old. Plus, there are some good batters in the Sri Lankan side. Don't get me wrong. I like Asalanka. And uh, there, there's stuff to like about Samara Vikrama as well. But I don't see those guys being as explosive as Kusal Mendes. So I feel like he really holds the key. And if he comes good, Hasaranga comes good. And, you know, one of the seamers or another spinner comes good. Then I see Sri Lanka winning games. And that, I think, is more of a complete package as a unit than what Bangladesh have. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting. I, I still think if Sri Lanka can ever get their full strength bowling lineup into a World Cup with all their seamers and their, their spinners, they probably just need that two or three batters to explode, right? And and they could do that. I don't think they're a semi-finalist chance, but maybe they're the sort of team that can be fighting for the semi-final um, spots in, in that situation. I, and I think that's where... Uh, I think that's where it's quite interesting if, if you look at it from that perspective. But look, there, I, I think there's something going on in Sri Lankan cricket at the moment, um, and that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, let's suppose Nisanka and Mendes, Kusal Mendes, they they open, right? And then you've got that new kid as well, Kamindu, who was once an ambidextrous spinner, but is now a batter. I was there when he made his debut, man. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And then, you know, Samra Vikrama might not go at that pace. You know, he's, he's a touch slower, but... He's scoring consistently. Asalanka's there and thereabouts, plays spin really well. 
I feel like in the bowling, you know, if they can restrict teams to 140, 150 odd, they'll be winning a lot in the in the World Cup. And, you know, they have Asaranga. Mm. They've got Tikshana. And Tikshana is, you know, Dhoni's guy in Chennai as well. So he'll be completely fueled for this World Cup and will have a lot of good game time under his belt. They've got a new slinger. Took 5 for 20 in the final game. Took a hat-trick as well. A very Malinga-esque hat-trick, mm. if you will. And it's interesting to me how ever since we've seen Malinga... We have seen, you know, I can't even count the number of slingers that we've seen on my fingers anymore because there's always a new one around the block. And within Sri Lanka, now you have Patirana and this Nuwan Tushara guy who did mm. really well. I mean, 5 for 20 is, is solid. You know, we I think we had them a little bit in history, but they were coached out of the game uh, by the more traditional teams. Mm. I know that there was... Uh, an indigenous player whose name I'm going to forget, um, but it was the guy who knocked Bradman over, who I think his action was probably more like Fidel Edwards, but again, that similar kind of style. So it did exist before. And remember, at one stage of cricket, we had round arm actions, right? Like this, it's not, we didn't go from underarm to overarm. We actually went from underarm to round arm. And then eventually we had a mix of round and overarm kind of bowling. So it's always been there, but I do think that sort of, and I don't know if all these guys are beach players, but certainly in Malinga's case, that sort of, it makes sense on the beach. And I remember playing a, a game in Gaul uh, on the beach and there was another game going on where, where really serious players were going on and we went and had a look. And there was a guy there doing it, left arm, basically bowling like Malinga, probably 75 miles an hour, just getting it through. And I was thinking, God, if they, they could get three or four of these guys every generation, they'll be doing really, really well because you'll still produce your normal bowlers as well. So, um, no, I think it's fa I think it's a fascinating one um, uh, to go through. And, you know, the one thing that I say about Sri Lankan cricket is they, in a way that New Zealand are very good at tactical innovation, Sri Lanka is very good at technical innovation of just like, no, we're going to do this. Whereas, you know, I remember there was an, an Australian bowler who uh, wanted to bowl round arm in T20 cricket. And he did it in the nets and everyone said it was impossible to play. And he went back to his shield team and bowled a couple to show everyone what he was doing. And the coach came up to him and said, you do that again and you will never play for us. <laughs> um, there's a big difference in the way that some of these cultures think about uh, technical stuff. Yeah. No, and uh, he is a different kind of slinger compared to mm. Pathirana, let's say. And, 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 you know, for those of you who haven't watched that hat trick, go and watch it because he got... You know, two guys bowl through the gate or whatever. Or, well, slingers can never bowl anyone through the gate. But you get what I mean. Under the gate. Yeah. And then uh, there was one LBW. So, it was a really attractive looking hat trick. And, I mean, they all they always get these exciting paces. You know, Madhu Shanka was another that we saw in the ODI World Cup. I feel like Sri Lanka just need to figure out what that bowling attack needs to look like. Like, what's the first string bowling attack over here? Mm -hmm. And that might help them a lot in the T20 World Cup. No, I think that's that's more than fair. I mean, you know, a lot of teams are going to have to work this out on the fly, and this is probably good conditions to do it because we assume the World Cup will be at times on similar kinds of conditions to what we're seeing now. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly for those teams who play their home cricket in Asia and, and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, you know, they should be happy that the World Cup is coming to the Caribbean if they make it to that stage, of course because the US will be where it will be played initially. Anyway, that kind of wraps up overthrows for the week. So if who everyone, for everyone who came in the comment section, thank you for all the interactions and for all your love. And if you like this video, like it, share it with your friends and subscribe to both this channel and Jared's other channel on YouTube. We'll be back with another episode of Uncovers. Uh, Uncovers, wow. Uncovers. Uh, overth overthrows next week. <laughs> That'll be all for today. Uh, goodbye. And those of you guys who are with us on YouTube, stick around. We're going to have episode 75 on, up on Uncovered come after this break shortly. So yeah, stay tuned. Easy for you to say. Support us on Patreon and help us keep making our content. Join for exclusive perks like the AMAs, the live calls, and to chat with me directly on Discord. You can also enjoy ad-free content, early podcasts, and access to my emailer. Step up your cricket-style game with Bodyline t-shirts. Explore their exclusive player-themed t-shirts, including favorites like Virat Kohli, Kane Williamson, and Ben Stokes. They also have team-inspired designs and options for hardcore cricket nerds. Their collection offers something unique for every fan. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 75 of the Uncovered podcast. I'm Behram Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. We've got lots of topics, Jared, uh, off the field. They've... Uh, they've you know, been a bunch of things that have happened. Some of them are direct, kind of linked to on-field stuff, but 
we'll we'll start off with Jimmy reaching the 700 mark uh, in test cricket of course he becomes the third bowler ever to you know accomplish that feat of uh, getting 700 cricketers out in test cricket and also he's the first fast bowler he's probably going to overtake warney because warney's at 708 so he's eight wickets away and he's gotten to this landmark in 187 test matches at an average of 26.52 now that average was never that good in, let's say, his first 87 test matches. After that, Jimmy Anderson really started peaking. And sure, he has regressed in the last year or two. But, you know, before that, that was the best that we've seen of Jimmy Anderson ever. And there's this phrase that gets overused with him that, oh, Jimmy has aged like fine wine. Well, at this point, I would like to probably flip that. Like, fine, oh, this fine wine has aged like Jimmy Anderson. That's where we're at. Did you see his parents in the um, in the ground for the test match? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know, to go back to the question we were asked on the previous podcast about what makes someone able to bowl fast, genetics plays a big part. And it's just like, you're looking at his parents going, wait a minute, if he's 41, how old are his parents? Because they don't look <laughs> particularly that old either, you know. And so... Um, yeah, genetics plays a very, very big part in where we are. But look, I think the big question for me is, you know, we've talked about Jimmy so many times of, is that it? Is this going to be the highest amount of wickets we ever see from a seam bowler in test cricket? And I think that if we had seen, um, if Courtney Walsh had played in a similar era, hmm. I think he would have taken even more wickets. I think he was a slightly better bowler than Jimmy Anderson as well. Um, uh, not you know they're both great, so that we're both talking about the top level. Um, but we know that he played so much more in first class cricket and had to absolutely dominate people in first class cricket rather than in test cricket. But the point being is that does mean that in the space of what forty years we've had two guys who potentially could have done that. So I wonder if there were more guys before that, especially looking at some of the the, the old county bowlers who ended up with thousands and thousands of wickets, right? whether we will see someone else able to do that. But then you've got the argument of, will there be enough tests played? Hmm. Uh, will the best bowlers actually play enough tests, e even if there are enough tests played? Um, and and will they have to come from India, England, or Australia to even be within a shout to be able to do something like this again? It's remarkable. I, I, you know, I put a tweet up about how Jimmy Anderson's test career started just before uh, MySpace, right? You know, really, the birth of social media as we know it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there was one guy who's really angry. He's like, dumb, dumb. Social media started six years before. And I was like, mate, no one knew what social media was until MySpace got big, right? Like, but MySpace is the thing that made social media into social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but that just shows like we, there are whole people listening to this podcast who have never lived in a, a year, in a, in a, a year of their life without Jimmy Anderson being alive. Right? Uh, sorry, without Jimmy, Jimmy Anderson being a test bowler. It's a remarkable record to be able to do that. The only other scene bowler I think who has played as many years is Imran Khan, and he doesn't really bowl by the end of his career and was an all-rounder, so it is slightly different. But it's just ridiculous that what he has done so far, and, you know, I think we can all nitpick at his record of, you know, of oh, this, he didn't take as many wickets when he played away, and, um, you know, he, he wasn't as useful um, um, in certain situations and everything else. But it's like he took 700 test wickets. Like, do you know how hard it is to take a test wicket, to take 50 test wickets, to take 100 test wickets? And he's got 700 of them. It is absolutely ridiculous that a seam bowler could take that many wickets. Yeah, and I mean, even if we look at his away record, you know, if you look at it in recent years, sure, he might not be as incisive as he is in England, but he doesn't go for runs. He holds no. up one end. He's, you know, very, very hard to get away. I think that if you look at the 2000s, you know, because in the 90s and 80s, that's like the, the era of fast bowlers. I feel like Dale Stain and Jimmy Anderson are two names that come up. Of course, I rate Stain higher and, and the numbers suggest that as well. And, and he was a different beast altogether. But I feel like Jimmy's constant will to upskill and learn and keep mm. his body fit. I mean, longevity is also a big factor in this. You know, not everyone can pull that off. And sure, him giving up limited overs cricket helps. And England playing like 10,000 test matches a year also helps. But... What he's achieved over here is actually a record that I feel might never be bested. It can't be broken just because to get 700 wickets, as is, you'd have to play, you know, 20 years, even if you're playing for England, 
right? Mm. And now even England isn't playing as many test matches as they used to in this last cycle, right? It's it's reduced for them as well. And the other nations don't play nearly as much. And then you'd need to have a bowler who's ready for test match cricket at 19-20. Yep. So all of those things, if you look at or them combined or factor them in, them in, I don't think that cricket will see another bowler who will play test cricket for that long and will, you know, take more than 700 wickets because it's just, Jimmy himself is like a freak of nature. He, he's a marvel. And uh, yeah, I mean, Courtney Walsh, like you mentioned, was was the guy, uh, McGraw was there who, who came close to 600 or crossed 500, let's, let's put it that way. But 700 is a different number altogether. And you would have to be either the most prolific bowler in history and get there in 15 years, or you need to go as long as Jimmy Anderson did and just make sure your body holds up, which is pretty impossible. Yeah, so you need to be a freak physical specimen, mm. right? So, so let's let's put that to aside because Courtney Walsh and Jimmy Anderson certainly freak physical specimens in a way that even McGrath wasn't, if we're being honest. Although he was more on that sort of verge. Um, so you, you need that. The one advantage the next generation player will have will be sports science. So you know Tom, Tom Brady and these tennis players who are you know playing later and later, and we know that we're going to see. We're going to see the best players kept on the field or on the court longer um, because of that. The problem with cricket is that you would also, for this really to be broken, what has to happen is that probably the three formats need to separate. Hmm. And test cricket needs to be run as test cricket. And then you need someone who is really, really a good test bowler but doesn't actually have that much value in what might be the higher um, paying uh, leagues of T20 cricket by that stage. If that's the case, and we had like test cricket played on its own with very little overlap, ex- except when players occasionally swap swap sports, you know, like rugby league and rugby union, um, or NFL and rugby rugby league and rugby union, those sorts of things. There is an opportunity then that you might play teams might play more consistently test cricket because they have to to make money and and it's sold as a league and all those sorts of things. But you still need to be the freak physical athlete in the first place, and then you you know a lot of things have to go your way. You know, if you look back with Jimmy Anderson, like it's a, it's a rem- it's remarkable that he's even in the position that he's in. You know, his action didn't make as much sense when he was younger. Um, they tried to fix it in England. They almost broke him in half by trying to do that. Um, he's he's at the cutting edge of sports science when it comes to cricket because England have really invested in that. But let me tell you, Jimmy Anderson is not exactly the most progressive thinker when it comes to that sort of stuff, and. You know, he's not always happy with all that sort of sports science stuff. Um, so it really is remarkable that, you know, it, it's it's gone on uh, to the position it has. But, yeah, he, he physically, it, it's that ability to, you know, be able to run in and bowl as consistently as those guys do without it taking the sort of wear and tear on your body that it should take. Yeah. And I think uh, to a certain point, you'd also have to credit his hunger. I think that really counts over here because a lot of people, they play international cricket for a long time and then they lose that hunger. And that's what a lot of retiring players say that, oh, we just lost the love of the game. We didn't really feel like competing at that level anymore. Jimmy Anderson does want to compete at that level till he's around. I feel like this guy never wants to retire. And uh, England kind of backs him with that as well. They're like, okay, yeah, if Jimmy wants to stay on, that we're going to keep trusting him. And I feel like even though he might have reached the twilight of his career, Jimmy Anderson is the sort of guy I feel who'd be like, oh, Sachin has played the most number of tests, huh? 200. I'll become a fast bowler and beat that, right? I'll play 201. And he may as well do that, right? Because 14 test matches for England is not a long period of time. He'd probably get there in a year and a half. And if he has a good English summer, we very well might see that happening because... You know, uh, he's still good. It's not like he's garbage, right? Even on this India tour, it's not like he was absolutely decimated. Sure, Jesswal took him on and whatnot. Um, But still, I feel like, you know, this is a guy who is one good series away from, you know, (laughs) wanting to stick around for a bit more longer. Well, it's ridiculous. He's a 41-year-old seamer. He was still England's best seamer in India, wasn't he? So, where he's not particularly well-suited as well. So, um, yeah, look, he's a son of a bitch type of before Mark and and I know I think you are right I do think he's looked at that Sachin record and mm. I don't know that doesn't mean he'll make it because there's a lot of things that need to go right um, in order for him to do it uh, I, I did this I can't remember which video it was but we did this thing years ago where I looked at at the age of 30 his record was very similar to Matthew Hoggard's mm. right and England just moved on from Matthew Hoggard the minute it looked like he'd lost half a yard of pace and around that same period I want to say is when 
George Bailey smashed Anderson everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I, and and so at that stage, I thought they're going to do the same with Anderson. They're just going to try and find someone faster and younger to, to come in. Not long after that, really masters the wobble ball. Yeah. And, and it is the thing, it is the reason we are talking about him today. Mm. It's all well and good to say that Muhammad Asif was the, the genius behind the wobble ball and Stuart Clark yep. played a big role in it. And, and some of the, you know, we know that, funnily enough, the guy I was talking about before, Courtney Walsh, also yep. bowled one accidentally, right? So we know that other people have had it. No one has mastered it like Jimmy, not even, Muhammad Asif would have if he stuck around. But yep. something else happened to him, I can't remember. But, <laughs> you know, Jimmy is now bowling balls in that last series where the ball was swinging and with a wobble seam. That's how much he has upskilled that particular delivery. We are seeing absolute mastery, right? And, and outside of Philander and, and Asif, I don't think, and maybe Stuart Clark, I don't think I've ever seen a bowler as skillful with the ball in the hand that Jimmy Anderson is. And that's why he's still around at the age of 41. But as I said before, he's also a son of a bitch. Look at him fighting with Shubman Gill. He's still mm -hmm. an incredible, you know, competitor, a fear, you know, fiercely, you know, he feels it more than other players do. And that is generally what, what brings you on and, and what keeps you around is that he wants to keep going. Um, like he's already set up the next part of his career. You know, the tail enders podcast is fine. I don't know whether he'll go to Sky or if he'll go to BBC or TalkSport or whoever needs him at that stage. But media wise, it's Jimmy Anderson. He hasn't, he isn't going to have any problems there, but uh, you know, he, he dyed his hair in this series. And I don't know this for sure, but I can tell you I'm pretty positive of this. He dyed his hair because he was sick and tired of everyone talking about his age because he thinks he could still bowl. And that's why he did it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And he can come and correct me, but I don't believe I am. Um, and he that's not a, the sign of a man who's about to leave the game, right? Like I could have seen him take the 700th wicket and be like, no one's ever done this. No one will ever do this again. I, uh, you know, I'm going to, if you need me, I'll be on my podcast. And that's not what happened, right? He, he, he fought through that and, you know, and continued. And um, I think it really does tell you a lot about, you know, who Jimmy Anderson is. He just is an incredibly fierce competitor who wants that next wicket. And, and, and that is the difference between other athletes who love playing the game and, you know, leave earlier because sometimes the, the passion goes. His passion yeah. has been there from ball one to ball 38,000, whatever he's up to. Yeah, something like that. And I mean... Who's to say in his head he probably wants to beat Murley's record? But, uh, you know, you spoke about the wobble seam and how he's mastered it. Uh, recently, with the pro sports people, I was doing these short segments of build your perfect batter, build your perfect bowler. And when wobble seam came up, you know, my co-host picked Mohammad Asif because, you know, he was a pioneer of sorts mm. and it makes sense. But I picked Jimmy because I was like, sure, I get the Asif conversation, but no one has mastered it quite like Jimmy. So yeah. he would be my wobble seam bowler in that perfect, you know, assembly of, of, of a fast bowler but anyway uh let's move on uh of course we've mentioned how jimmy has now played 187 test matches well there were four new entrants to the 100 test match club johnny bairstow who has 6,000 runs after 100 test matches ravi ashwin who has over 500 wickets after 100 test matches now uh, kane williamson who has what eight and a half thousand runs in 100 test matches and tim saudi who has 380 wickets in 100 test matches so Four very experienced senior pros. They've gotten to that mark. And uh, first, I'll have you rate them <laughs> in terms of who you think. Sexiness. Yes. Oh. And, and then I want to ask you, how many more of these entrants are we going to see in the future? Because it doesn't seem like that's going to happen too frequently. I think what's remarkable is we saw four in the space mm. of 48 hours. And how many more will we see a year from here on in? Based on how cricket's currently being played and the direction it's going. Um, I think Ashwin's probably the best cricketer. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I have a bias towards bowlers. So I'd probably pick Ashwin over Williamson just because I think it, that's more important. Um, but yeah, probably be Ashwin, Williamson, Southie Besto, um, off yeah. the top of my head, if you want me to rate those. I mean, I that's, be, that's yeah. almost with no thought at all, but just, you know, you've asked for the hot take. You've got a hot <laughs> take. Um, but yeah, I do. I do wonder. I think Usman wrote a really interesting piece about how you know it, there was a period where it felt like everyone was playing a hundred tests, even you know, and and then we got to a period where it's like it's really rare to see all format players playing a hundred tests again, which is which is very very 
uh, interesting. You know, we had podcasts where people have asked, like, who the worst player to play 100 tests is. And, you know, caveat on that, of course, no one is a bad cricketer if you get to 100 test matches. Um, but, yeah, you could you could argue that certainly um, Besto is probably towards the lower end of that. I don't, th I don't think he's the worst, by the way. Um, I mean, when he was a keeper, his average of 37 looked really good. And he actually averaged more with the bat when he kept wicket. Yeah. Ever since he's given that up and after those early basketball successful test matches in which Bairstow kind of single-handedly almost won them those games, it's been downhill for him. And now his numbers, when he's not keeping, look worse with the bat. So you'd have to think to yourself that out of all of the, you know, uh, what do you say, specialist batters who've played 100 test matches, how many of them have averaged less than 40? And I think that's where people kind of have that issue with Bairstow. But you've got to remember, he wasn't always a specialist Keeper. batter. Yeah. 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 I think Atherton is certainly one that played 100 tests who averaged less than 40, didn't he? I think he might have been another one. Ian Bell averaged over 40. And I'm not sure I think of best, I, you know, if you, and I, I really like Belly as a person and I loved him as a batter as well, but I'm not sure that best though isn't a better all round cricketer and isn't of more use to you. Um, it just happened to be that Belly played in an incredibly flat batting era. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, you know, so, so there was certainly, that was a part of it, but, Overall, um, I think all four of them are, you know, really incredible cricketers. And you look at Ashwin, incredibly skillful cricketer, but not a modern athlete. Uh, Williamson thrown in well, you know, probably two or three years before he was ready to be playing international cricket, had to work it out on the fly, um, had to overcome the elbow injury. I was talk we were talking about Southie before of, on the previous podcast about how he there was a pit period in his career, I thought he might have been finished just because he looked too slow and he worked out a way to put on that extra half a yard. And then he struggled with his in swinger and he developed this three quarter wobble seam ball and, you know, becomes a, a big player again. And, and Besto, I mean, how many times have we all thought, oh, Besto's done. Besto's <laughs> done. And then for about a year, you know, it's like, oh my God, he might be the best. Um, he, he might be the most impactful batter in the world right at the yeah. moment. Right. And, and then, and then you think impact. he's done again. <laughs> Impact is the word that's synonymous with Bairstow. He is a match winner across formats. And I think England have valued that aspect of his mm. game a lot. And they won a World Cup. Remember, they were almost down and out in the group stages in 2019. Bairstow scored those tons, right? That, that got them back on track. And even in test matches, right? You look at that India test match that happened after the IPL and all of that stuff. The first baseball test between India and England, which, you know, Kohli was kind of having a go at Bairstow. He got charged up. He scored like, what, 170-odd? And they chased 370-odd, if I'm not wrong. That's how mm. it went. So he's had his moments. And I really like Johnny overall as a utility cricketer. And up until the point where he kept wicket, I thought that he was really a cheat code for England because you get the impact. You get, you know, decent wicket keeping. And you get, you get wicket keeping. You get wicket keeping. Yeah, yeah, sure. But then again, you know, I always looked at him as a plus player. Very recently, I've started thinking of him as, oh, Maybe the time is near, but maybe he'll prove us wrong again. That's Johnny Bairstow for you. Look, he's, I think he's an incredibly driven person. I don't think I'm, you know, breaking any ground here to say that he is a um, volatile personal, hmm. you know, a person. I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, we just saw him sledge as he'd gone out in a losing series, but, you know, but he, I do think he's a person who does crank himself up and, and occasionally he gets himself into like almost a Zen state of genius. Um, but there are flaws within his game. And and look, all those cricketers, Ashwin can't always play away from home because he's got Jadeja in. So you could, you know, Kane Williamson essentially against the three best bowling attacks he's gone up against has only made runs against South Africa and almost all of those are at home, right? Like, you know, all these players have... Uh, small uh, issues within the, their um, their game. And, you know, Tim Southey isn't particularly quick, but they're all fantastic cricketers, right? And, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, I remember when Southey came on the scene and I was writing my blog and no one knew who I was. And I said that Southey and, and um, Ishan Sharma were 10-year bowlers. And you, mm. the amount of abuse I got, and, you know, and sometimes you could see it in those players um, a long way out. And I don't think I ever saw that with Bairstow. I think I did with Ashwin. I certainly did with Williamson. Um, mm -hmm. And so in some ways, you have to respect the fact that Bairstow has forced his way into a conversation with these three other guys when they, from a very, you know, you know, from a skill and a, and a talent mm -hmm. level, are just above him. Um, like, you know, and 
that doesn't mean that Besto won't be dropped soon and we, we you know maybe goes off to be a white ball player as well but it, it I, I think he's done incredibly well to get the most out of his career um and maybe not a great player but certainly a player of great moments yeah i think that actually sums it up quite nicely and of course the other three you i, I always expected them to play 100 test matches in fact i really want tim saudi to get to 400 wickets as well because uh, you know He's done the hard yards. He's even captained them at this point. And sure, he's not the bowler that he once was. But, you know, him and Bolt, and, and we were talking about this in the previous podcast as well, him, Bolt, Wagner, and Jameson, that four ma- four-pronged pace attack is one of the best things we've seen in Test cricket for a while, right? And it got them a World Test Championship as well. So, yeah, uh, good to all, like, good job to all of those guys for reaching 100 Test matches, and, and I'm happy for them. Um, let's take a short break. We'll be back on Uncovered to talk about uh, the latest from Pakistan. I've got some fun news for you guys. So stay tuned. You have Biram and Jared on Uncovered. Uh, we'll be back after this short ad. If you watch this channel, you'll love us on Maine, where we do deep dives into the greatest cricket stories every week at Good Areas. How did Virat Kohli play that shot? What is so weird about Neil Wagner? And explaining the incredible misery of being a New Zealand opening batter. Visit our Good Areas site today. Want to show the world that you not only love cricket, but that you know the game deeply. Well, you need a Bodyline t-shirt. In fact, at Bodyline t-shirts, you can actually buy a t-shirt about Bodyline, but also tees inspired by the greatest players in our game. Head to Bodyline t-shirts today. Welcome back to Uncovered, episode 75. You guys are with Behram and Jared. And uh, I'm not sure if you caught up with this news, Jared, but I'm here going to the stadiums and all of that stuff. And I'm up to date with everything that's happening in the PCB. Um, much to your surprise, there is a new PCB chairman, right? And the PCB have, have changed chairmans uh, at a faster rate than Alistair Cook used to have his opening, you know, uh, partners. Changed. Partners. That, that, that's where we're at right now. So the new guy, Mohsen Nakwi, was acting as the chief minister of the Punjab province as well. So a conflict of uh, interest went out the window once again. And he was doing both jobs at the same time. And he might even hold another ministry in this new government. So it's all over the park over there. I'm not sure what their plan is. But this guy has come and met Pakistan's key players, like centrally contracted players and other, other ones as well. Got them in the same room and said a few things where he said that, oh, if I hear of any politics, I'll get rid of all of you guys. And uh, he also said that, look, when I took up the CM job for Punjab, I went through financial or incurred financial loss and I made that sacrifice to serve my nation. So I expect you guys to make that sacrifice as well. And that's basically where we're at. He's also said that uh, you guys will be sent to train with the army because when I look at sixes and if I see one go into the stands, I assume that it's a foreign batter because Pakistan batters cannot hit sixes which are big enough. So he wants AB9s and KP12s and for that he's sending them to an army camp and I really don't know what else to make of this because why doesn't he? Just, if that's the case, why not just pick the soldiers? Why aren't yeah. they hitting nines and twelves then? Absolutely. Good luck sending Azam Khan to an army camp. But um, you know, it's so ridiculous that just saying this stuff out loud makes me look like a fool. It's just totally bizarre. I, I just I can't. Yeah. Anyone who comes in on the nationalistic thing of like you guys have to make sacrifices fuck off this is their job this is their livelihood this is their chance of changing their family's immediate future but also generational future in some cases right also didn't use uh, asif ali could hit some pretty big sixes but that's a different conversation um if the car can hit some pretty big sixes too Mm. anyway um did a freedy go to army anyway sorry um i mean have you have you watched uh saima you bat he's like this big and he hits Massive sixes. Yeah, it's just nonsense. Um, so, yeah, all that worries me. A politician coming in saying that there shouldn't be any politics well, mm. is obviously ridiculous. And, like, uh, did, do you see the Republican uh, response to Joe Biden's State of the Union? Um, no, I did not. It's, it's worth, if, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's worth it for just, like, who wrote this? Why did you make her say it this way? Why is she in a kitchen? Um, this is this is like the cricket version of that. We just like, no, everything you've said here is wrong, right? And and it doesn't make any sense. So here's my first question: Does an does a soldier has to ha- have to have the same version of athleticism in the field that a cricketer does, right? No, 
So how is that? So if he doesn't know that, what, who, who's the grown up in the room to say to him, that's a terrible idea. You want them to get fit. That's fine. Let's get the best fitness consultants from around the professional sport. You know, let's get, I don't know, baseball consultants or, you know, uh, surfing consultants or whoever works on core because cricket is a core sport, right? Let's get that in and, and make that work and, and have a go at that. The politics stuff of like, uh, of a person who works in politics coming in and saying there shouldn't be so any politics at cricket. It's like, okay. The whole idea of sacrificing for your nation. These guys, any, any professional athlete, male, female, is sacrificing their body every time for whatever the badge is. Now, a lot of them get paid really good money. Some of them don't, but a lot of them get paid really, really good money. But they are sacrificing their ability to walk upstairs when they're older, right? They're sacrificing perhaps in their, their brain usage if they've been hit in the head too often, right? All those sorts of things. I mean, uh, ask Will Pukowski. Uh, Pukowski, Phil Hughes put his, like, literally lost his life playing the sport, right? Don't give me shit about this whole thing. I hate people who say all that sort of stuff. Also, also if, if you know professional just, athletes, you know that when they're playing, it doesn't matter who if they're playing for some shitty team in the middle of nowhere. Quite often, they just try really hard anyway because then that's why they're really good because they're always trying really hard. Yeah. Also, what he doesn't understand, this new PCB chairman, is that, look, this isn't the army. They're not serving the nation. It's not no. a do or die, life and death sort of situation at all. This is their profession. They have limited shelf lives. Also, asking... it's the same for mo a lot of soldiers. Th this is where it really annoys me because I know, I, I don't know about you, but I come from an era where a lot of people were poor and they went into the army to make money. Yeah. Right? Because they That's knew. The same case over here. Yeah, like 18 and, at 18 and 19, they're like, okay, if I'm going to make money in the next couple of years, um, it's going to be really hard for me to do that without going to university and getting you know, this. And I didn't do very well in high school. But if I go to the army, I might be able to get other, uh, you know, other um, a training within the army. I might even be able to get university education sometimes within the army and to be able to do that. So this whole idea that every soldier just does that. I, I knew guys that went into the army because they always wanted to play with guns. And it was really hard to get guns in Australia. Right? There are many different reasons people go into the army. I'm sorry. It's 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 a again, it's a stupid point, but that's because we've got a politician coming in saying stupid points. Yeah, I mean the whole sacrifice thing, right? It's so dumbfounded because this is a guy who is obviously, you know, if if, if he was this chief minister of the Punjab, it's not his only job, right? Uh, he also has some news channels and whatever. So you are not suffering any financial or incurring any financial losses. Why are you expecting this from the prayers and strong arming them into making this into a whole nationalistic, patriotic sort of situation? And you are not, you know, helping bridge that gap that has been created between the players and the administration. Like, I'm not obviously going to name the player, but I was having a conversation with one of, you know, Pakistan's players, um, you know, recently. And we this came up, the army camp came up and he was like, Ever since the Asia Cup, we've been playing non-stop cricket. Is the army camp the solution here? Like that is oh, also, not. someone tweeted this week saying, "I hope, I hope we talk about it on this episode." And at that stage, I didn't know the full comments. Um, and but they were just asking about the army. This happens quite a lot, especially in Asian cricket. But we've seen it Australia and England as well, getting army consultants in and everything else. So I think. Brad Haddon's podcast, um, I saw a clip on TikTok this week of of um, Matt Hayden when they went, they did like an army training session and Shane Warne was there and the guy said, you can only take the most important things. And so Shane Warne had his cigarettes there and the army goes, well, we can't take those. And Shane Warne's like, the king doesn't get on this bus without his cigarettes, right? Hmm. You tell me if, if Barbara Azam can't do, I don't know, 20 um, chin-ups or something, right? And he's getting yelled at by some army person. He just doesn't get down and go, okay, find another Babarazza. Good good luck. Imagine yeah. imagine a player is recovering from his injury. Like Naseem Shah is going through rehab, right? And you make him do some sort of army exercise that completely fucks him up. Like, we've there's seen that, that aspect of this as well. We've, we've seen that before. We've seen players do those sorts of things and get injuries on these sorts of camps. Mm. And I'm not saying these fit. I, I think these sorts of camps are really important. Because they do bring the team together. Sometimes they bring them together away, uh, against the coach, but they do bring the team together and, and bonding and physical act and, and getting the teams fit. Look at Misbah getting the team fit before that England yeah. series. I'm not against all that sort of stuff. I am against the idea that the army will fix this problem. And that is specifically what I've seen in a few Western teams and a few Asian teams before. It's just like, that's, that's not what this is. 
You are not dealing. The army isn't recruiting a millionaire to come in and do something for them, right? Yeah. The army is recruiting a bunch of kids who don't know better or maybe the sorts of people like your, well, not your chairman, but the PCB uh, chairman, uh, you know, who believe in the cause. That's not the same as Shane Warne and Baba Azam and, and these other people. And and it, it's, it's ridiculous um, to think that in that kind of situation. There are ways of doing this sort of stuff. As I said, I really think bringing a team together, making it so that everyone signs a, a condition of fitness and you go to, um, uh, uh, oh God, I've forgotten his name, Azam Khan, isn't it? The, um, yeah. the wiki keeper. You go to him and you go, we're not trying to get you to be Shadab Khan, right? But we want you to be the best athlete you can be. I think that's a great way of doing it. If it's just a drill sergeant yelling at him, I think that's a stupid way of doing it. You need, I think in these sorts of situations, and this is someone who's worked with teams, and I've worked with multiple teams, right? Everyone needs to buy in. You are with my podcast for your own personal reasons as much as you are here for, for, to work for me, right? You know, Muku on the production and, you know, uh, Ari and Cheyenne and CS and Estelle, all these, you know, Janaid, all these different people who work for us, right? They're here partly because they believe in what we are doing and we're building towards something, right? But they're also here for their own personal reasons. So I know that Sean needs to develop and that you need to be able to do different things. And Estelle will eventually need a podcast that is all about her and all these sorts of things because that is part of the reason we're here. Yeah. Everyone is the star of their own story, right? And, and if you talk about professional athletes, they've been told they are the star from almost the time they come out of the womb. And if you throw them in a situation like this, just thinking it will work, that's not what you need to do. You need to be smart with these things. And yeah. this sort of stuff, it just sounds, well, I mean, everything he said does not sound smart. Now, he could be a genius. We could be wrong. He, he's got a career in media or something. He worked for CNN for years. He's a producer. I trust producers because generally they're the smartest <laughs> people in, in, in the media, right? Um, but I also know that what he's said there sounds like a fantasy and like he does not understand modern professional sport and that is a huge red flag i mean go for specialized co coaches with core building and you know no yeah. look hits and all of that stuff there are people who do this for a living there are specialized jobs you know that are held by people who excel at this sort of stuff who are not the army there is one guy in pakistan hanif malik and every player who's doing you know well with respect to power hitting is coming coming in and crediting him yeah there's heaps of those him. people coming through yeah, yeah exactly hi that guy and, and i recently I bring asked, over trent uh, woodhill again yeah i asked mohammed wasim of how what you know makes iftikhar special and i noticed a tilt in his front foot when he sets himself up to hit sixes and i was like is that it is that the secret sauce and he said that his base the way he sets himself up allows him to go for those shots so there are technical things that you could work on which could improve their power hitting I, I agree that big boy power is something that lacks in Pakistan cricket. But sending them to the army when they have no buy-in. If this cricketer is coming and telling me that, oh, we haven't had rest for so long and now we're going to the army, that means that the team is not particularly bought into your philosophy. And if you don't have buy-in, it's not going to work in the first place. So Mizbah's team, when they went to train with the army, they had that buy-in. They wanted to get fitter. They knew how important that England series was. But this guy is just coming and strong-arming these players like the last few chairman have and he's just basically saying the same thing that hey i think this is a solution you will do it my way or the highway otherwise here's my, you're all out here's my other issue it sounds to me that he doesn't really understand modern professional sport right now i could be wrong but it sounds just based on what we've heard so far yeah when people come in and they take over a position and straight away they say a bunch of things instantly yeah. i think that they, they are not open to actually seeing what the key issues are and how to fix them and remember, the first thing that this guy did was uh, end Harris Rao's central contract, terminated. Yeah, I mean, so it's getting from bad to worse. And and who knows, he might not even be the chairman of the PCB next time Jared and I speak. I was anyway, going to say, well, he might yeah. not be around next week. Because <laughs> because uh, Pakistan cat, cricket will still be the cat the might go longer than his job. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, I was in a PSL presser, and I've got something really fun for you. Azhar Mahmood had a very very hot take. He said that the coach and the fielding captain in a T20 game should be mic'd up and that the PSL should be innovative and we should start this at the PSL. So that instantly made my mind go towards uh, Cronje and Woolmer because yeah. they were doing this prior to the 99 World Cup. And then during the World Cup in the first game, I believe it was against India, uh, Saurav, 
you know, kind of called them out. And mid-game, they did not know what to do with it because they weren't breaching any laws. But then they did say that, hey, the World Cup is not the time to innovate, so take it off. And mid-game, they took it off. And Woolmer stuck by it, right? Cronier even said that they don't think they were doing anything wrong, but they didn't do it there on. Now, the interesting bit over here is that those guys later, or well, at least Cronier, got caught for fixing. And my head instantly goes there because, of course, Pakistan has had a bad rep when it comes to fixing. Even the PSL has had instances of fixing in the past, in the earlier seasons. And what if, like, I'm not saying the teams will use this for that purpose. Maybe Azhar Mahmood is being innovative and he's took some inspiration from US sports, particularly the NFL. Mm. But, you know, your mind instantly goes to the possibility of, hey, what's if there's like a jammer or something that kind of intervenes that call and something else happens? Is that the biggest threat to this sort of innovation or do you have something else in mind? I mean, that's probably the worst case scenario, isn't it? Um, I, I suppose, though, if it's happening in other sports, like most sports have more conversations from off court to on court or off field to off on field than we do, right? Um, they seem to handle it fine, um, it, but it's a it's a it's a big difference. The one thing that cricket has is that we have an on field coach, hmm. right? So I love the quarterback position. But I really, I love the Manning brothers probably the most as quarterbacks because they were actually calling the shots, right? They were so brilliant at what they did um, that they could make the decisions live on the field. And that reminded me of cricket, right? I, I love the idea of that rather than a quarterback who's just listening to someone in a head, headset and then going, okay, we'll go with this. And you see it with, with basketball as well. Like, you know, coaches calling out plays all the time. Yeah. That's fine. I don't, I don't have an issue with it. But actually... Yeah, it, football, uh, football, the coach is always on the touchline and he's yelling exactly. uh, out players. And basketball, that's easier. We've seen Darren Sammy do that during the PSL right now. He's going proper touchline coach right now. For exactly. So, and, and, and I, so I think it's already happening anyway to yeah. a certain extent. I think we, I think if we had coaches and, and other people involved, you would have... I think you'd see more dramatic tactical swings, which would be really, really interesting. But you would be changing the fabric of cricket. I'm not against it. I actually think in some ways that T20 cricket is still too similar to test cricket and ODI cricket. And I would love to see for some more innovation. Do you know me? I want 15 players playing uh, um, in every single game. And uh, I think there's heaps of cool innovations that we could be doing. But we, we, we have to be aware that we are changing the fabric of the game. And um, look, as an analyst, would I like to be able to pass messages to a captain? I mean, fuck yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would ever let me have the mic. Um, uh, the player would take the earpiece out and throw it on the ground. I would annoy them too much. But it's really hard to get messages from off-field to on-field, even yeah. in the, what Darren Sammy's doing in, in all these different ways. And I think a lot of coaches feel useless during a game. And that's a weird place to be because it's your future that's on the line, right? But that's also the skill of being a cricket coach, of getting players into the right, you know, mindset that you need them to be in and making the right decisions. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I can see both sides of it. I'm not massively anti it or ma massively for it. Um, I could see certain captains wouldn't, it, it, as cu cricket currently goes, I think certain captains wouldn't be involved in it and other captains would be all for it. But I, I could see how in the future everyone would be doing it more or less. But you'd still get... The Man, you know, the Manning um, style, MS Dhoni style of totally don't need to say all that much in the year. I, I almost think that when you're watching from off the field and you've got your coach, your assistant coach, maybe you're bowling, you're batting, your fielding coach. So you've got that five person group. You probably got in modern cricket, you've got at least one analyst, maybe two analysts in, in the room. You have like this really great ability to have incredibly interesting conversations about the game as it's going on, um, which you can't really do in basketball and football and everything because everything's moving too quickly. But cricket has those yeah. pauses. So you can have those conversations. So you could see how it could be really, really helpful. The other thing is, how much different is it than what Nathan Lehman and Owen Morgan do with their chess moves hmm. um, pieces? It, it's a fine line, right? He's getting messages to the captain of England or Kolkata from off field already. Um, it's so in some ways we're already doing it. And every time a fielder goes to the boundary, there's a bowling coach there whispering in their ear, telling them stuff. So uh, I, I could see this would make a lot of people angry, but I can also see that it's, we're maybe already on, a, uh, on our way there. Hmm. 
I mean, what I would like to see if they are to make it work is that I think it would be a necessity maybe to record the conversation and then some corruption person or anti-corruption person goes over it. So at least that takes care of the fixing part, right? The other thing that I was thinking of in terms of caveats is that let's suppose you're the coach, right? You have a screen in front of you and there's been an LBW shout and the umpire hasn't raised his finger. So as a coach, now I can tell the on-field captain whether to review it or not because I have a better vision courtesy of all the cameras. And that, I think, would put the game into disrepute because, I don't know, that should be an on-field call. That shouldn't come from outside. I don't know what, what it's like in all sports. Obviously, I watch a lot more basketball. But when a basketball um, coach is going to make a decision, they quite often look up at the big screen before they make their reviews anyway. So I can't imagine that that isn't happening in other sports already. And if you remember, we used to have that. Teams used to turn around and look at the um, dugout to see if people had a, or more the change room than the dugout and see yes or no whether they should take the review. We, we decided in cricket we didn't want that, which is fine. Mm. Um, again, isn't that just giving the team more of a chance of getting the decision right? Anyway, so I, I don't know if I have an issue with that again. But you're right. I mean, it, we, we've already started with substitutions. Hmm. We're not going to end with one, the silly substitution rule we have at the moment, right? It's going to go further than that. Mm -hmm. We already have uh, an analyst making decisions off the field. We already have coaches now on the on the boundary, as you said. And, and Sammy's doing it. He's not the first um, coach I've seen in T20 cricket to do that. We really have these things happening. I think there will be a natural progression towards those sorts of things uh, one way or another, whether occasionally we decide not to. I mean, baseball is a perfect example of baseball was progressing towards uh, having the fielders in the position where the players actually hit it. And baseball fans said, no, we don't want that. Hmm. We might find a situation in T20 cricket where we're like, no, we want Dhoni. We don't want Brendan McCullum or, you know, or Stephen Fleming in their ear. That's uh, actually... One interesting thing, because you will have these captains who will be like, no, I don't want to diminish my power as yeah. the decision maker. But then again, cricket is one of those sports in which the captain has to make a lot of decisions. You know, captains in other teams or, or sports don't have to do that. But the cricket captain has so many things to think about. Yeah. Field settings, bowling changes, matchups. Okay, uh, what time do I need to use this bowler in a test match? What's the surface playing like right now? What will happen when the ball gets older? It's a lot of information for one person. So on one hand, you'll have the captains or those sort of captains who'll be like, nah, we're fine without the airpiece because we want to do all these things ourselves and we don't want to have our head crowded. But on the other hand, the positive is that it kind of releases some of the pressure off from the captain and you have the entire management making those calls. So, I mean... They're mm. pros and cons on both sides. I, it's going to be interesting to see how this sort of innovation develops or whether we see it at all or not. Oh, ag agreed. I, I do think it is interesting. I, I think cricket will change quite a lot in the next 10 years because I think the new generation is moving through who doesn't see all these things that, that you know, Man Mancat is a perfect example of this, of just people being like, wait a minute, we're, penal we're upset at the bowler because the batter can't stay in his crease. We just, I think there's a whole new generation of people who are looking at cricket differently. And, and hopefully we're part of that conversation on here as well. And um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so, I, you know, in the future, I think there will be things. Whether this is one of them, though, I don't know. Like, you know, you very rightly pointed out Mankad and how that's a cultural thing. Different countries respond to it differently across the globe. And Ashwin has been that torchbearer. I've seen so many instances, you know, when they're checking for the no ball in the PSL where they could have done it, right? The batters are always outside of the crease. And now why are the batters always outside of the crease? Because Pakistan has kind of taken that stance that they don't like this. And no, that's how you know why? It's because they, the army would stop them from going out of the crease. <laughs> Easy there now. If not you, they might nick me. <laughs> but anyway, final topic of the day. Of course, we had some wholesome content last week when we mentioned that uh, moment between Colin Monroe and the ball boy. And uh, so I thought, and some of our team members suggested that we have this one on over here as well. Viv Richards running onto the field when the Quetta Gladiators qualified for the playoffs. We've seen Viv be this passionate in the PSL year after year. It's been going on for eight, nine years now. Never, ever gets old. And he's not someone who is actively involved in cricket all year round, but comes around for the PSL. He's just a mentor for the Gladiators. And I feel like when you think of the PSL, you think of Viv Richards and Darren Sammy and David Bisa and all of those people who have been so deeply entrenched with mm. the fabric of the tournament and Pakistan cricket and everything that surrounds it. 
that that's kind of one of the unique selling points of this tournament. And did you did you guys the video? Did you watch him make that run? Yeah, no, I did. Here's the thing about Viv Richards. I've met him a couple of times, and he's a natural competitor. Even when he's a love, I, I've always found him to be a lovely person when I've met him. But he's a natural competitor. You could just see it with him. And I remember a few years ago being really um, angry with there was an Indian guru. I think his name's Sad Guru. I think is his name. Uh, a complete charlatan, self help bullshit nonsense. The same as ever. All those sort of people are. And um, he did this video where he said, you know, Virat Kohli is like um, Viv Richards, but unlike Viv Richards, who is just laid back and chilled and, uh, you know, doesn't take anything too seriously, Virat Kohli has a real fiery passion within him. And other than the fact it was a racist stereotype of West Indies, I was like, have you never seen Viv Richards bat? Like you're wrong on a cricket level before anything else. And I think that you go back and you look at Viv Richards, there's a fire within him, right, that to be successful for almost political reasons and, you know, uh, based on who he was and where he came from and everything else, he's just a competitive human being. And I think what that video kind of shows is that it's still there. And it doesn't always go there. I, I know, you know, I know former players, I, I've had this conversation with a couple of players who kind of, when they retire, let it all go. And they just become like grandfathers, like at the age of 35 and 36. It's it's incredible to watch because you can see it. They are at 34. You don't even want to have a beer with them. And at 36, you're just like, oh, okay, he's come out of the bubble now and he's a normal person. And Viv isn't one of those people. The reason that Viv Richards is one of the greatest cricketers who has ever existed is in part because he has this incredible fire going through him at all times. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was having a conversation with him with a former cricketer recently and we were talking about Viv still being involved in the PSL and he said it's an embarrassment like you know he's not even coaching what's he doing there blah 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 and I said I think Viv just wants to be there because he likes to do stuff like that like I'm not saying the money isn't a part of it because hey we all take mm -hmm. the money but I think he could go on the speak he's Viv Richards he could turn up in commentary boxes and he could go on the speaking circuit and he could take photos with people at old sports conferences and he could do many different things in order to get the money. Viv really likes that side of it, that competitive side of it. it it's not an accident that he was one of the greatest cricketers of all time. It, you know, it, it is part of him. And so, you know, watching him get so excited over that, um, I think that's important. I think it's also important to T20 cricket that it's now at a level that someone like him can take it as seriously as he does. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, we early on we had the Shane Warne saying Yusuf Patan was one of the greatest innings of all time. No one even talks about that innings anymore, by the way. Yeah. Um, and we all just went, oh, fucking hell. Okay, Warney. Whereas now we are starting to see some former players really take this shit seriously. And that's what happened with one-day cricket. See, people don't the, the kids now are not old enough to remember that in the 90s, one day cricket was not taken seriously. Like I once I asked Ricky Ponting once why he took one day cricket so seriously when all the players before him hadn't. And he said, I didn't know they weren't taking it seriously until I got to the Australian team. Right. <laughs> and, and it takes that sort of thing. But it also takes the commentators taking it seriously and the coaches taking it seriously and everything else. And T20 cricket now is is a really important thing. And, and I, I love that Viv gives, gives a shit because, you know, I, it keeps him a little bit relevant too. You know, it keeps his name alive. And um, who knows what's going to happen in the future of cricket. But Viv Richards may not always be in, in the, you know, the first name that comes out of our mouths. And he was the greatest white ball player, even before it was white ball cricket, yeah. by such a distance that it is, it is incredible how much better he was than any other player in his era. And he never got to cash in on the, that on the way he does. But he gets these moments and he gets to be involved. I think it's really cool. I mean, he's literally run that amount of distance in celebration. Also, good on him for being fit enough to be, yeah. to be able to run. Well, how old is he? He's probably in his late 60s, isn't he? Yeah. I'd have you're, to imagine that he is. You're not going to be running like that at his age. No, I mean, no. to be I fair, probably, I, I he's 72. At, oh, there he is. 72. Yeah. yeah. No, you couldn't run like that now, let alone when you're yeah. 72. That's um, what I, I was going to say. He could, he could outrun me as is. I'm a 30 year old. He's 72. He would win. Yeah, but my just... my I, my knees hurt watching him do it. If we're being honest, yeah. so no, I I just thought it was great. I and I, I you know it's a he really is a special cricketer in the history of our game, mm -hmm. and I don't like any disrespect to to Viv because I think what what happened with Viv was 
everyone got sucked up in the coolness of Viv. And I think that's great. And he obviously was a different kind of player. You know, with with all due respect, you know, Dennis Compton and Keith Miller, we didn't have too many cool cricketers before mm -hmm. Viv, right? We had a couple, but not many. But that disrespects how great he was at cricket and the way he thought about the game and how far ahead he was in one day cricket compared to yeah. anyone else of his generation. He he was really the, you know, the WG grace of T20 cricket in that he was at, so far ahead of that generation. He's not, it's not, a, it's not like a Bradman situation. We're talking about literally, he was a great player at it when it wasn't even a real thing. That's true. And I mean, it's fitting, all the more fitting that he's involved in the Premier T20 competition. And, you know, we all love to watch him get all passionate like that. And, and I'm sure there's so much inspiration that all of those guys in the Quater dressing room draw for him and have been drawing from him for years on end because he's been constantly involved. And, you know, Pakistan cricket for a lot of times is all about the vibes. He's definitely kind of uh, fulfilled that bit. Anyway... That wraps up uh, this Uncovered episode. So everyone in the comment section who was interacting, except you, J.S. Smith, you can go fuck off. Um, all of you guys, thank you so much. And if you like this video, throw in a like, share it with your friends, and uh, yeah, subscribe to both this channel and Jared's other main channel on YouTube. We'll be back with another episode of Uncovered next week. That's all for today. Goodbye. Remember that cricket is a funny game. A hundred years before we protected our head, players looked after their groins. So don't be as stupid as old cricketers. Protect your computer now. NordVPN is the protection I use when facing cyber shortfalls or when rights issues try to dismiss me. Geoblock so you can watch all the cricket you want. Grab your NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber. Support us on Patreon. Join for exclusive perks like AMAs, live calls with me, and a vibrant Discord community. Enjoy ad-free content, early podcast episodes, and access to my email, plus behind-the-scenes stuff. We've built our channel on Patreon support, so a huge thanks to everyone who has helped. If you make a lot of content like me, oh, you are going to need help. And that is why we use Minvo.pro, a slicing and dicing tool that uses AI to conjure up incredible clips from your podcasts and meetings. If you make content, go to Minvo.pro to cut it. Oh, we're still live. We're still on. We're still on. Yeah. <laughs>